today. OK, let's start with the first one, Amahle. No, no, sir. I think I spoke wrong, sir. OK, and then Warwick, Mitchell. No, nothing. Um, next person, Eluira. I hope I'm saying that right, Marianne. Godfrey Nisi. And then the yes. Yes, Godfrey, you had your hand up. Is this a, a, a historic hand or a new hand today? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sure, bro. What what is it? Tell me. I think it was a mistake. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And then Alphas Matebula. Also, your last person's hand was up. I just don't know if it's a question or it's a historic hand or error. Oh, bro. Sorry, this is quite free. I think I was terrified yesterday. It was when you, it, 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 it was a, a question that was based on, on the limits of the 25,000, you know, but, but, I, but I think I, I got terrified. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, okay, okay. So it looks like these are historic hands. All right. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Um, I think before we start, I, I remember I promised you we're going to deal with that apportionment calculation. So I'm going to start by sharing the screen. I managed to find one of ours, um, which is not a, it's not an exam from, um, what should I say? Not an exam for PIC and LEAD, but it was an exam, an old one from RAF when we used to have it at UNISA. And I just want to do that now. Tell me, can you see the screen? Yes, yeah, you can see the screen. Okay, now I don't know why this is such a huge thing there in the way of way of the screen there. Let me just try that. Okay, no, then it completely takes it away. Okay, so anyway, today we got this, colleagues. I'm telling you, we're gonna get this. Um, so I did, and also yes, I found it in Klopper's book. I think I might have an edition, which is the fourth edition. I don't know if there's a newer one out, but anyway, I picked it out on page 287 and his paragraph nine. So he also uses the, the same um, question, same kind of figures as well. The only difference is that he used 30% 30, 30 negligence instead of 33. So normally when the passenger is negligent, it's normally around 30%, roughly around there, right? That's what um, is normally applied. So if we look at the question, so first of all, I want you to scrap everything that you learned and let's start fresh. Are we there? Yes, we yeah. are. All right. We so... Right, so we're saying A forgets to wear or neglects to wear his seatbelt. A is injured by the negligent driving of B. So A is a passenger and he was found negligent. And in the scenario that they like to use almost everywhere, the court found A 33% negligent, right? They'll tell you now why we're using 33% because then it becomes important later on. Now driver B, is also negligence. So in this scenario, both parties are negligent. There's another thing I want to tell you about negligence. Um, Prof, you know, yeah. Yes, sorry to disturb you. Mm -hmm. uh, the the oh, yesterday's God. recording, it was yeah. shared by Zuki Swakala. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it requires a password. Oh. Yes. Um, Can she assist regarding that? Okay, I'm not sure, is she in? I, can you see, anyone can see if she's in? Okay, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to check for you, okay? I'll check on this, uh, on, on Teams if she's there. Um, so otherwise, I spoke to her earlier. Puff, is this being recorded if the case were isn't here? Just hold on a second. Let me, let me minimize everything. Yes, it's I being recorded. Yes, I, I can confirm it's recording. <laughs> Just Where are we, guys? Please help me. It is are recording, guys. Are we using Prof, notes? It, on is, Prof, it is recording. 
OK, great. I'm just trying to see if I can see her in the meeting here now. Um, just give me a second. She'd probably be right at the end somewhere. No, she's not in the meeting, but at least it's being recorded. OK, can I just send Sorry, her? Prof. Or, yeah. Sorry, Prof. I just want to find out. Sorry, Prof, I was not in the class yesterday because of network. So I want to find out, are we using the, the notes, the slides, or are we using the study guide? Where are we? OK, so we use, uh, what I'm doing is I'm using the slides. I um, okay. prefer to use the slides and what from page? the slides, from the slides, so we roughly at the stage, so I don't follow, we're still on road accident fund claims today. Um, we're roughly at the stage where we're dealing with damages. So we're dealing with now oh special and general damages. We're going to start there. So with regard to the recording, let me finish that apportionment question and then let me quickly send her a message to tell you what's the password. Is that fine? I think she's okay. online. I think she is. Sorry, I can open I'm my attachment without the password. Yo, guys, what's happening? Okay. Okay. Who said somebody I said that it opened without a password? <coughs> yeah, I can open my recording without a password. Yeah, it's your is this is this part laptop that requires a password, not the recording. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So then issue kind of. Uh, prof, yeah. Prof, can I suggest something? Hmm? Can people raise their hands? Then you recognize them instead of everybody trying to talk. So the one problem that I have with that is I that I have only one device that I'm using, which is my laptop. And there I'm actually reading from the screen. So I put it on a slideshow. And then when I do that, because I'm presenting on the actual screen, then I can't see the hands. So we can help you with the hands, Prof. All right. Who, who wants yes. to assist with the hands then it's fine if you want to do that. Otherwise, uh, for me, yesterday worked fine uh, unless that was an issue with you guys. No, Tell but uh, the, 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 the people are talking and then we don't know who's talking. You know, it just becomes confusing. OK, maybe we do this, that when you do ask a question, just quickly state your name. Just say, for example, Elani. And yeah, there we go. Then we know that. But I don't think it's really necessary that we need to really know everyone's name. I think we are getting the gist of it, right? Were you able to hear everything clearly? We don't uh, have to another, another suggestion. Uh, yeah. When I look at us, we are yesterday we went up to slide number 46. Mm. And we have up to more than 109 slides to complete. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to make it with yeah. so many questions? OK, so let's try to let's try to do this, right? Let me go through a couple of slides and then when I say, OK, before I move on to a next section or I say, colleagues, are you following me? Then then we are. That's that's your chance to ask questions. How's that? Yeah, but people must raise perfect. their hands, not just that's to perfect, perfect, uh, prof, you can continue. All that's right, right. OK, colleagues, right. Let's get on with this now. We are. We're uh, losing on time there. OK, so anyway, we went back to the question again from yesterday. So our passenger is negligent because didn't wear a seatbelt. So we, the court found 33% negligence on his part. Now, the formula, now this is what you must just remember, the formula that's applied for apportionment generally, right, in principle. Apportionment is only applied to the portion of damage caused by one's own negligence. Do you all understand that? Yeah. Do you understand the principle? Portion apportionment only applies to the portion of damage which is caused by your own negligence. You got that far? Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Then now the passenger's damages amounts to ten thousand rand, and I think yesterday's example was hospital expenses. So this is just a given fact, right? If a passenger, it's only a given fact in this question. It's not coming from anywhere. This figure's got nothing to do with anything else. It's just trying to explain the principle. So it's saying that if passenger A wore his safety belt, his damages would have been 4,000 and not 10,000, right? So it would have been 4,000 instead of 10,000, right? That's just a factual thing they've put in there. Now, according to our formula for apportionment, it's only applied to the portion of damage caused by your own negligence, not the full amount. We're repeating that, right? So the course, the portion caused by his own negligence is therefore the 6,000 Rand. Are we all following that? Yes. Yeah. 
All right. Now coming back to the repetition, the court found a 33% negligent. So a the passenger now is entitled to 10,000 Rand less the apportionment of 33,000, which is then applied to the 6,000 and that equals 1980. Right, so it's 10,000 less the apportionment, which is applied to the 6,000 Rand and that is 1980. So then when you take the 10,000 and you minus 1980, you end up with 8020 and that's what the passenger is going to get at the end. Right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, uh, please, can you explain more, please? Huh? Okay, what, can you explain to me what your problem is with that? Um, I, I, I don't know how you, you came this across. This is me, you. Um, it looks uh, like you. Uh, it, colleagues, no, the rest of you, please yeah, put your mics like off. Me. The person who's speaking, can we just have him speak, please? You, you, you came across the 8,000, 820 ranches. Okay, so how we came out to the 10,000, 8,000. Remember the passenger's claims is 10,000. Look at the cursor, right? So yes. in a, now he was found 33% negligence. And we said negligence only applies to that portion of damage caused by your own negligence which is the 6,000 Rand, right? Yes. So yes. now just look at this table here. So the passenger is entitled to 10,000 less, and here you've got to do another small calculation inside. So less the apportionment principle, which is 33% of your 6,000 Rand. And that's how you reach 1980. And then you say 10,000 minus the 1980 gives you the 8020. Okay. Yeah. I all right. Thanks. Okay. So, so the sorry. Yeah. So the eight o two o is it what he'll be entitled to get? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I uh, don't stress, please, because it's not gonna come. We haven't asked this in a long time. It's just for your knowledge. It's not even in your guide, so don't stress about it, right? But it's there for purposes of knowing in practice. Okay. Moving on. Hi. Sorry. We Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'd just like to ask, um, with regards to uh, the apportionment value, if you can go back, I, I it's not on our screen at the moment, but um, it says not 1,000 Rand. Does it, is, that a, is that a typo? Is that supposed to be not 10,000 Rand? Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay, cool. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Okay. All right, okay. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, right, colleagues, let's move on, right? Because we've got a lot to get through to still today. Now we want to deal with damage. And when we deal with damages, remember early on I said there's patrimonial damages or there's special damages and non-patrimonial or general damages. Just different words meaning the same thing. So patrimonial damages, one gentleman said very nicely yesterday, it's something that's sounding in money. It's something that can be calculated. And usually the actuaries uh, do a lot of the calculations as well. And you get calculations from medical legal reports. Now, with general damages, it's always harder to calculate in terms of money because a lot of the times we're looking at subjective things of what the patient or the client or the plaintiff himself or herself went through. And there's a subjective element that's also attached to that. So normally they look at prior awards and generally they take the fair and reasonable approach. Um, on this table here, on the left hand side, we've got patrimonial damage and non patrimonial. Remember, that's general damages, non patrimonial damages. So on this column on the left with all the red, right? Um, it's past and future. These are the different heads of damages you can get. It's past and future medical expenses. So those are separate, right? Remember, past is something that happened in the past and future is something still in the future that you are still going to go for some kind of medical treatment. So that is actually two separate heads of damage. Same with um, loss of income. Then traveling and transport costs, that's also a head of damage that can be applied. The cost of a nurse or aid, a manager or assistant, loss of services. Another big important one that's fine in practice a lot is they call it most of the time loss of support, not really loss of maintenance. 
and funeral and cremation costs. So these are all special damages, right? Easily quantifiable sounding in money. Then the heads of damage um, in terms of general damages, you get pain and suffering, psychological trauma, emotional shock, disfigurement, loss of amenities, loss of, loss of general health, shortened life expectancy. Now I said NB here because usually these ones are in a global amount, just stated general damages. They don't normally in summons and particulars of claim separate these heads of damages. That applies normally with the special damages. And then when you're dealing with proof, there was a lady I think that asked me yesterday, what is a type of proof? And I told her, hold on, we're going to come to that now. So with proof, um, let me just put it back onto slideshow so the screen is a bit bigger from current slide. All right. So now with patrimonial damage, um, past and future medical and hospital expenses, it's a given that you're going to have to actually use the invoices and the bills, right? So they call it vouchers as well in practice sometimes. And future medical expenses, you will actually rely on a medical legal report, depending on what expert you have um, appointed. Um, then you get loss of past and prospective income. That also, it is based on calculations on earnings. Um, and there also for future, you'll use a future actuarial calculation. Transport and traveling costs also, it's just basically bills. Cost of a nurse or aid is a quotation. A loss of services also can be an actual bill or an actuarial calculation for any future services. And then loss of support. This is an important one. Loss of support. Um, I will explain to you just now that it is capped currently. There is a limit on what you can claim and how it is applied. It's two parts for an adult and one part per child. OK, and then there was a case in your guide. I think it says McDonald where this was not applied properly. And then funeral and commission costs that also again is just invoices. OK, so at that before I move on to loss of support, any questions? Um, let me just clarify a bit. When you said part for adults and one part for a child, maybe uh, uh, explain what that means. Yeah. Yeah. So when they do a calculation in maths, do you know what ratios are? Do you know what ratios are? Like, for yeah. example, if you have a, let's take a piece of pizza and it's got four pieces. So then, for so, or, or let's just, let's just say yeah okay there's a pizza with four pizzas so let's just say for an adult you will choose two parts meaning half the pizza and for a child it will be basically quarter of a pizza so it's just basic math basic proportion so it's two parts per adult and one part for the child remember there might be quite a number of children but basically the whole family will share in that global amount that you get which is still capped do you understand that Okay. Right. Um, any other questions? Okay, moving on. Then loss of support, um, paragraph 10.5.9. So one of the ladies asked me, I think yesterday about age of retirement. So age of retirement is generally, generally 65. It can be earlier, for example, look at the case of Cook versus Road Accident Fund, um, or it could even be later than 65 if proven. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a general rule, right? Then we have another person asked yesterday about the question of children. When does their support end? So it's usually 18 or 21. That's the general guideline, but the courts still say until self-supporting. So there again, you have to look at the particular circumstances of the case. It depends on the circumstances of the case. Remember I told you some people could be coming from an affluent family or like they want their children to have degrees or whatever. So they would be self-supporting a bit later on in life. But the minimum calculation is age 18. Then the widow's claim for loss of support. Oh yeah, remember what is loss of support for? When what happens? When the breadwinner dies. The breadwinner dies. Yeah, right. 
Now the widow's claim, she claims until the husband would have reached retirement. So if he would have lived and reached age of retirement, basically 65. Now the loss of support claim doesn't lapse on remarriage. So let's just say she, the husband passed away and five years later she remarries. It doesn't necessarily lapse. But if her new husband earns less than the deceased husband, then she would claim the difference for the loss. And a wife married in community of property. Remember with family law, um, you already actually inherit half because you basically share half of everything. So the wife already inherits half. And then remarriage prospects, the statistics are halved. So also it depends on the circumstances of the case, how young the wife may be, etc. Colleagues, somebody's mic is on. Jongi Kanya. Jongi Kanya, please switch switch off your mic. Thank you. Okay. Certain assets are deemed already to be available for the wife's use, and that they give an example, for example, in the house, the furniture, etc. as well. And no account should be taken of the fact that the widow is able to go out to work. So you cannot state that, OK, the husband died and you've got a, a woman that's um, or a wife that never worked. And now all of a sudden now, because the husband died, you're expecting her to work. So that doesn't necessarily get taken into account. And then the widow's pre-accident earnings are also taken into account. So these are just some of the things or some of the factors. If you remember from your law of damages, these things are taken into account. Um, loss of future earnings now, paragraph 10.5.8. Remember I spoke about deductions and contingencies that are applied. So there, no. they, yes, colleague, you can continue. On the previous slide, please. Yeah. Now, you say uh, retirement age 65, right? Mm -hmm. Generally, that's uh, yeah. just, just generally, right? Not a hard and fast rule. Okay, if you're an attorney, you, 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 there's no retirement age. You can work right up to 80. Uh, uh, yeah. So my question is, if uh, the, 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 the spouse becomes a widow at the age of, uh, say, uh, when, when, when the husband is 64, and the claim takes about, say, two to three years or three to five years to be mm -hmm. final. What happens in that case? Because remember, although the spouse has passed on, he can continue working and be, and provide for the family till 70, 75, because there's no age retirement as an attorney. What happens in that case? So wait a minute. In your in your case, did somebody die, though? Who's still working and who's too passed away? Did, did the attorney die? No, no, it's an hypothetical example. Yeah, the attorney has passed on. Okay. Right? His wife. They yeah. pass on it. See. So this it's is. Yes. I get. Real. I get what you're saying. So that is also coming down to basic um, uh, common law principles dealing with loss of support and how they actually calculated. So they work on the age of general age of retirement, sixty-five. But you can have. You'll have to actually prove it. You'll have to prove the circumstances. And remember, you are going to have. Um, different medical legal reports and experts reports that would state these things to say that, you know, this person was in good health, they would have carried on, etc. A couple of years would have carried on more. But they looked at, they also look at mortality tables and that kind of thing. So it is a lot of factors taken into account. But yeah, I get what you're saying. It's 65 is just a general guideline. So you're going to have to prove a lot though. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, how do you approach a uh, loss of support in a situation which uh, includes uh, uh, the parents having died in an accident and then leaving a disabled child who's unemployable? Is it also limited to? Okay. So uh, remember, with loss of support, you are going to try to get back what you lost. So let's just say that the parents died and they were supporting the child. Then the road accident fund must now try to provide funds that can cover that gap, basically, or that loss. So it again, it's it's um in general principle. That's what I'm saying. Is they gonna? Is, let's just say that the 
maintenance cost for this disabled child, let's just give a rough example, 10,000 Rand. So still, then you're going to claim that 10,000 Rand monthly from the RF. And obviously you'll take into consider a, a, a CPI index. And again, another actuarial calculation will be involved. But these are just basic principles that you must know. The actuaries calculate everything. Has that answered your question? Yes, 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 understood. All right. Now, remember with loss of support and loss of future earnings. OK, so let's deal with future earnings right now. Um, I can't remember the page in your guide. If somebody can just check and then shout out the page number so that you all have the idea of the page number. But basically, there's a cap. That... OK, great. So there's a cap that applies to loss of future earnings as well, OK, as the loss of support. But let's deal with loss of future earnings. So when it came out, um, when this road accident fund amendment came out, remember applying to accidents 1st of August 2008, um, they came out with this capped amount that said it started off with 160,000 Rand. And then every few months, uh, every, every so four times a year, they keep changing that amount to keep up with inflation, etc. So right now, I don't know what is the figure sitting at? What is the latest value from 160? Can anyone tell me on your on your on your table that you see what's the latest amount that they've got there? Um, I think it's 248. Yeah. Yeah. Right now we're sitting at 248 and how they work it out is you look at the date. So let's just say uh, and what in which 248, what is the date there on the table? 31 July 2016. 2016. No, isn't there a more recent one like 2022 or something there in your table? I think for 23 is something like 340 or something. I see even in your paragraph two it's somewhere I saw it as well. 307074. And the date? What's the date um, there on the table? It's uh, 30, 3107 2021. Okay, so they haven't really updated it to current values right now. Um, OK, yeah, no, I see. So for example, on your page 12, where they say the annual loss of support, so loss of support and loss of future earnings, they kept it at the same amount. So on the 31st of the 7th, it was at 160. Then just as an example, I'm giving you on the 31st of the 7th, 2016, it was there at 248,000. So what you do is you look at the date of the accident. Let's say the accident happened on the 30th of July, 2016. It falls within that bracket, meaning that 248,000 Rand applies. So you just got to look at the date of the accident and you got to check the table. Yeah. You all understand that? Yes, yeah, sort of prop. Actually, the latest is 30 April 2022. It's 319-810. Mm, sounds more, yes, yeah, that yeah. sounds more like it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, so where do we find these tables? Forgive page me. Page 56. Page 56, thank you. Yes, the latest figure is right at the top. So let me have a look, yeah. 56 you said yeah there it is okay up until 30th of april so you've got to keep checking the government gazettes because they come out every uh quarterly so every few months every four months it's going to come out and it keeps changing so you basically got to look at the date of the accident um so these different cases that you can have a look at in the guide there's raf versus sweetman there's nell versus road accident fund as well and that'll give you a bit more of a guideline or explanation and then can I ask please? Oh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, uh, uh, Professor, who, who is responsible for hiring the actuary and paying for the service of the actuary? Yeah, you've got to do that. So it depends on whether you have a contingency free agreement act going, or whether there's that agreement in place where you say that um, you know you're taking it on, and basically then your firm has to pay for it. Or if you're not doing it on a contingency fee, then obviously you will be charging the client. You'll have to tell the client that you need, uh, we need to get this done. But the actuary, the actuary's uh, reports, you you must try to get it literally before trial, um, so that you get fresh data um, and it's up to date and very recent as well. But yeah, basically you've got to hire them. You've got to hire. You've got to 
appoint all of these people, but you've got to always run it through the client as well. Okay, I'm gonna ask a, sorry, I also want to ask a question. Go for it. Prof, so if, if you've got a partner or let's say you're not married, but you stay with your partner, can you also claim for loss of support or even if it's like an elderly, elderly person staying with you, for instance, your yes. mother? Okay. Yes, so and, in and other then, words, mm -hmm. the, the principle okay. that applies is that, you know, when a person is loving, right, they can be supporting a number of people. Um, in a lot of um, African cultures, it's a very normal thing even for grandchildren to still be supporting grandparents. Um, in many cultures like Hindus, Muslims, or even all kinds of cultures, they, they people are always um, supporting their parents. It's, it doesn't necessarily only mean children, parents, grandparents can also be a partner. So as long as while the person was living, there was that duty to support. That's the important thing. Establish that duty to support. If that duty was there and present and active, then you can always claim for that. Because the thing is that when the person died, there's now this loss, right? And then all these people within the family can now claim. But the biggest thing is, remember, you are limited to that table. Remember, it started off at 160, we're now at 300. That means that the entire family even if you've got like say a husband, wife, three children, grandma and an aunt and a partner, for example, I'm just extending the list greatly there. But all of those seven whatever people are sharing that now 300,000 Rand. Do you understand? So yes, Prof, that is what I wanted actually to get to is yeah. so it's not per climate, it's per yeah, climb. The whole, yeah. Everyone's oh, sharing from that amount. Yeah. Shame. Okay, Dra thank drastically, you. <laughs> drastically reduced. So that's what the amendments brought in. Before that, it didn't apply. Yeah, that's what the amendments. Thanks, Prof. That clarifies a lot. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Prof, Prof sorry. Uh, this is yeah. uh, page 56. I don't see anything on page 56. Forgive me. Which page 56 of what? Of the guide? Yeah, of the guide. So it starts off there. It says with effect from 30 April 2022, the new capped amount is published in the government gazette number. It starts like that. And then it's literally figures if you just see afterwards. Not actually a table, but it's just figures listed. Got it? Sulas, Sulas. Sorry, brother. Just to clarify, the guy, I was also thinking 56. It sounds like that, but it's 76. I'll check it. 76, brother. Sure. Mm, on so okay. on the on the soft copy, it's 56 if you've downloaded it from the site and on the hard copy we got it's oh. yeah, there's a I difference the between the pages. Oh, OK, I've also got the hard Thank copy. You. Oh, yeah. Thank you. OK, then let's move on to general damages right now. The RAF Amendment Act, remember everything after 1st of May 2008, we're going to get sick of that date, but we'll never forget it. Um, anyway, the amendment read with regulations three. Um, it came into operation and basically they try to now limit general damages. You can only claim general damages now if it is serious. So previously, before the amendments, whatever your problem was, let's just say you had a simple whiplash injury, you were off from work for two days or whatever. That kind of an injury, you could easily claim 12,000 Rand for general damages those days. Now, what happened is that from the amendments, they said, no, you are only going to get general damages now if your injuries are serious. And now we're going to look into what does it actually mean when they say the injuries are serious. So they actually give the procedure and they say as a medical practitioner under the Health Professions Act who's completed a training course, although they're not, not necessary because that hasn't been prescribed yet. But anyway, they assess your injury. So basically, the medical practitioner must do this and they assess your injuries and how they do it. They start off with the process of elimination. So they first look at the table and they see, do your injuries fall in the non-serious injuries list? Right. We're going to get to that now. So if the injuries fall within this non-serious list, then they can say, OK, so it's not serious. You're not getting any general damages. Are you following me so far? Yes, we yeah. are. Okay, then, um, then this was challenged at some stage, but the constitutional court back came back and said, no, it's fine, it is constitutional. So we continue with it. 
In the case of Road Accident Fund versus Duma and three other related cases, now there the Supreme Court held that the medical practitioner must actually physically examine the person. So you cannot have a medical practitioner that's looking at records in the past, you know, like you just send an email or fax copy or scan stuff. So now the person, the medical practitioner must actually physically examine you. That was what came out from the case there. And then I just said, see the discussion on paragraph 12.1.3. Um, well, one of the important things that I see Prof, can I perhaps ask him a question? Yeah. Or, um, yeah. Um, I'm beyond September. I earlier raised my hand. And yeah. The, the ruling that was made at the start of this session is that someone will allow me to speak. Okay, go ahead. Happen, Just go ahead. Which didn't happen, yes. And I, I'm not going to take you back to. To, to slide number 52. I'm not going to take you back to that because I had a question okay. on when widows claim until the husband reaches retirement age, but I've sorted it out by myself because I think that you are using the life expectancy table yeah. um, in place. I would yeah. probably ask you to perhaps put your slide on presentation modes um, yeah. and then we can proceed with from there. Thank you. Okay, Prof. so I'm carrying on from the current slide right now. Tell me, do you see that nicely? Is it I on? Do see the I do see no, it yes, it's here. Okay. All right. There we go, colleagues. Okay. Um, I think just go. Yeah. Let Let's continue. But if you've got a question and it's a burning question, please let's get let's get because sometimes your question it assists with everybody. There's so much of knowledge in this subject, and it's impossible to know everything. But sometimes you learn things from questions anyway. Okay, so in the amended RAF one, that's just come out like literally recently. The medical report section, section seven, it now states that it can be completed by the superintendent or the representative to the hospital. That's just like a note on the side to remember. Remember I was telling you about the list of non-serious injuries, right? So this is the list. And it's basically regulation 3.1b subsection or Roman numeral one. And let's look at an example. For example, it says whiplash. Whiplash is, you know, when you uh, injure your neck there from um, impact, from your ne neck basically jerking, you know, from harsh breaking or whatever the case may be. Look at another one. Let's look at C, a mild sprain, a uh, strain, a tear or damage of a ligament, um, lacerations, which is like a cut basically, abrasions, fracture of a finger. So the fracture of a finger, that's considered non-serious. Um, let's look at another one, H, fracture of a toe or a foot. Also non-serious, a superficial burn, not serious. Um, fracture of the nasal bone, not serious. Any N, any bruising or bleeding, not serious. Um, then they say, okay, is O any sequelae in the form of pain or discomfort as a result of injury? And there they list from A to N or mild form of depression, anxiety, chronic headaches. So that's what they come across as non-serious. So they also, again, it's not you that will do it, but the medical practitioner will go through that and figure out whether any of those fall within the non-serious injury list. So if any medical complication, now this is important, if there's a medical complication that arises from any of these, then the claimant can still go uh, a serious injury assessment. So let's just say that the doctor feels that, OK, there's quite a few things that have occurred or falls on the list from zero, um, A to P, and this combination um, needs further investigation. It could actually be serious, and then he can still state, OK, we're going to do this uh, serious injury assessment because we want to find out whether this person really qualifies for general damages or not. So if the injuries do not fall within the list, right? So in other words, it's actually quite serious. It's not falling in the non-serious injury list. It's now considered serious. Then the medical practitioner now assesses it according to the AMA guides. And if it is found that the injuries resulted in 30% or more impairment of the claimant, and there they use the terminology whole person impairment. So they look at it holistically, the entire body, and if it's more than 30%, then compensation for general damages can be awarded. 
if the injuries are below that 30% or more of WPI, but then they fall within this narrative test below, then the claimant can be entitled to general damages. So if it's non-serious, no general damages, but if it's now because now it's been checked and it results in 30% or more impairment. So when the doctors check this WPI rating, right, they look at upper extremities, which is the upper body, and they look at the lower body. So there could be an injury to the arm and an injury to the limb. So for example, if you've lost your arm and you've lost your leg, you will definitely be in the 30% or more. Um, but if it's not falling within that 30%, because in the beginning, everyone was stumped. They didn't know, okay, no one's going to ever qualify for general damages at this rate. But then the doctors went into the narrative test. And then under the narrative test, there was quite a lot of people that now qualified for general damages. So under the narratives test, it says, A, if the injury results in serious long-term impairment or loss of a body function. So let's just say now you've got renal failure, you've got kidney problems or whatever, or if it constitutes permanent serious disfigurement. Now, let's just say you totally have disfigured your face or whatever due to injuries from the accident, or if it results in severe long-term mental or behavior disturbance, or D is an easy one. It results in the loss of a fetus. So if your injuries fell within that narrative test, then they'll say, yes, you qualify for general damages. Are you all following me so far? Yes, so we are. are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, we do follow you. Uh, but uh, why uh, are we the, using American Medical Association guide? Why not we yeah. have our local one? Yeah, no, we had this debate already actually but that is what happened is that when they when they actually came out with the amendments that is what they did they used these guides because they looked at the system that was followed in america so yeah unfortunately that is what they use so we don't have our yes but i'm sure now they are they are getting a lot of data that's uh, more towards our south african sorry colleagues there's a mic on there Prof, I've got a may i ask Okay, there was two ladies. One of you go. Yes. Yes, Prof. How long after the accident should you provide the medical report? Um, what I'm asking is, let's say you were in an accident today and there's yes. only some damages on your body or injuries yes. that you can identify only in two months from there. Yeah. Um, that's different from the medical report that was initially done. Can you yeah. resubmit it or what is the process doing? Very very valid question and we're going to have a look at that just now and your question is going to be answered okay thanks prof okay other uh, lady that was calling in just now another question okay colleagues i'm going to carry on since there isn't a question but just now we're going to answer that other sorry, sorry, prof. yes Yes, I just on your previous slides, uh, the issue of 30 percent. Why, why, yeah. why 30 percent? Why not 40 or 50? Yeah. No, that's exactly what they came out with. That was the regulation. The regulation said 30 percent. So if you were 29, sorry, you fell out of the list. <laughs> but if you were 30 and 31, you were fine. So that was just the way the regulation stated it. And that's what we had to follow. But I told you they became the doctors became quite um, clued up with it. And then a lot of people are now qualifying with a narrative test. So it, it's it's OK. But yeah, that's that's the long and short of the 30 percent. So anyway, with general damages now, they said that um, the regulation stated that the claimant, if he wants to claim uh, general damages and the injury is serious, then the RAF form form must be completed. It's a particular form. It's in your notes right towards the end. It's the actual form, right? Now, the report must be submitted or it may be submitted separately. That means your RAF1 is your claim form. Your initial claim form is your RAF1. That you've got to lodge straight away. But your RAF4 can be lodged a bit later. But please remember the prescription periods that apply um, the RAF1 was recently amended. Um, it was gazetted on the 4th of July, very recent last year, and this is in paragraph 5.10. And some of the changes are extremely significant. Um, there's a lot more detail required now than what was asked for in the past. Um, and one of the one of the weird things that they've got in the directive there is that the form must be completed in full, a form with ticks, dashes, deletions, 
deletions, alterations not accompanied by a signature will be regarded as incomplete. So there, this is um, some of the things that they've now actually been um, saying claims are not valid anymore for these reasons. And then the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund challenged these new requires in the case of Mautla versus RAF. And the court was ordered, uh, the court ordered the RAF to cease with enforcing the substitution of the RAF form. But now we are just waiting to see what comes out of this. So we're waiting the review. But in the meantime, they're saying, please comply with everything. Um, and then in the case of Van Zale, there was the lady that asked that question. So now in Van Zale versus Road Accident Fund, the court held that the RAF form may be submitted before the extended period of prescription. So in other words, it may be submitted before the five year period. So that was one one aspect of your question there. The cost of the assessment, the government gazette also stated now, because I think at some stage, some doctors were charging various fees. They were charging 10,000 or whatever, but now they've stated it's 2650. And the cost of obtaining information such as reports and that from doctors or hospitals, etc., cetera, um, that is still also still required. And that can, in certain instances, it can be claimed from the RF, but only if the injuries are indeed serious. So the RAF will pay for this if the injuries are serious and the RAF concedes liability. So they've like dealt with the merits and they said, yes, the wrongdoer driver was wrong. We're conceding the merits of the case and we are admitting that we're liable and you do have serious injuries. Somebody's got their mic on there. So the claimant may in writing ask the RF to consider this and this must be done. Um, they give a time period there. The RF has 60 days from re receipt of such request to actually consider it. Um, and then this amount of 2650 can be adjusted. Um, before the claimant, this is the, another part of the question that I'm going to answer the lady. Before the claimant undergoes the serious injury assessment, right? The claimant should have reached maximum medical improvement. Let me explain what this term means. So the lady was asking what happens if you got injured and only a month later, you know the extent of the injuries. So MMI is really the point in time where that's the point in time where you as worse as you can get. In other words, um, there's no further recovery and there's no more deterioration that's expected. So we have to most of the time the doctors will wait for MMI. It can, and it's also case dependent. It can be one month, it can be a year or whatever, but if prescription is looming, definitely get that form in because you can always deal with it again later on. So if MMI hasn't been reached, this is what we said on the last part here, then definitely lodge it. Um, the RAF, there was one lady, I think yesterday, I think she mentioned 90 days. So I don't know if this is where the 90 days coming in that she was speaking about. But the RAF must within um, 90 days of receipt, receive, so in other words, when the RAF now receives the RAF form, right, they must, they have a choice. They must either accept it or reject it. Or alternatively, they can ask the claimant to now go for another assessment at their cost. So they've got to do that. They've got to either accept the report, the RAF form, or they've got to reject it. Or they can just say, you know what, we want to send you to our specialist because we don't trust your medical practitioner, for example. Um, thereafter, the RAF must accept the further assessment or dispute it. Now we're coming to the whole section of dispute. And in your study guide, it is a very long section. There are diagrams there and everything. But I really try to simplify it here and break it down, right? So if the claimant actually intends disputing. Let's just say the RAF received the RAF form and now let's just say they're disputing it. They don't agree with it. So if the claimant now intends to dispute this rejection of the RAF form, um, then he, the disputant, which is your client, has 90 days of being informed of that rejection to notify the health, the registrar of the Health Professions Council of South Africa. And how you do that, you now got to fill in that dispute resolution form and that's the RAF5. So that's also in your guide there. The RAF5 is there, the RAF1, the RAF4, the RAF5 is there. So the RAF will bear the reasonable cost of the dispute resolution. However, 
the claimant will have to pay for his own legal practitioner. Are you still following me? Yes, Bob. OK, now when the amendments came into effect, right? Um, the one of the regulations was 5.1 and they stated there that um, only in emergency situations um, we will pay out for private hospital rates. But if it's not emergency, we're only going to pay out for public rates. But anyway, this was challenged and the Constitutional Court said no, this is not on. Um, so the, the way it currently stands now is that no matter what, whether your problem, whether the person was injured and they went to a private a health, private hospital or a public and whether it was emergency or not emergency, um, the, they will still pay out according to wherever the claimant was actually treated. So that regulation five was declared unconstitutional. OK, before I move on, are you all happy with general damages? And when you can claim it when the injuries are serious? Yes. Yes, Bob. All right. Now we have um, the amendments to the loss of earnings. Remember, um, we looked at that table, which wasn't actually a table, but more like a list of um, figures there. So section 17.4c of the Amendment Act, right? It limited all the loss of income to 160. It started off with that. We now at about 300,000 more or less. And this is adjusted quarterly and it's based to keep up with inflation. Now I need you all to concentrate because it's another math question here or another explanation. Again, it's not in your guide. They're not going to ask you in the exam. It's just for your information and I'm going to explain it, right? So we're going to work on 160 just as a basic guideline, right? Depending on um, the actual date of the accident, it, the figure obviously will change, but we're working on 160. So we're talking about loss of earnings, right? So there's an example now. If a claimant earns 240,000 Rand a year, so in the 12 months, they're going to basically get 20,000 Rand a month. Are we all following there? Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. OK, up to there we follow. And now let's just say for three months in the year, the claimant or your client was not able to work because of the motor vehicle accident, right? So now we would think normal people like us that the loss should be 20,000 times three and that equals to 60,000. But they said no, the formula that's applied, so they take the applicable amount at the time. So we using 160, so it's 160 divided by 12 as in the 12 months. And then you times it by the months that the person was not at work. And I just put it there, it's about 39,000 something rounded off, it's 40. But that's the formula that they apply. Let's not get bogged down on that, right? But this one is an easy one, right? Prof, can I ask yes, a Bob. question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you 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 reckoned this on divided by twelve. Um, crazy question. Uh, if the person earns a, a a bonus, and let's say he's way below the one sixty, uh, including the bonus, do they measure the bonus with it or not? A I I would assume that that is or, or that would be calculated because you have to work on what is applicable for the whole year. So normally our bonuses, most of our at least working people, it falls within our yearly salary, right? So yeah, I would think that it would. Okay. Um, but that only applies now for those particular months. Let's just say the claimant didn't work for one entire year and three months. So they wouldn't be entitled to that maximum of 160 plus the 40,000 Rand, which they want us to, to give there for the three months. Understood? Yes, yeah? thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. OK, we're doing well. Now, amendments to loss of support. Hello. 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 Yeah. But, uh, but a dead in check is not, it's not that it must. So why are yeah, we doing yeah. it? No, it's, it's, it's not just based everybody on gets the 13 oh, check, yes. but remember it forms part of your salary in, in a normal living year. Let's just say that I was alive 
and I earned um, a 13th check every year of my life and that money was used towards my family. Now I die and now my family's lost, including that 13th check. So that would still fall within the year. Within a year okay. at least. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, section 174 C. Yeah. I uh, just want to find out, is it necessary then to mention the annual earning of uh, of the claimant? Because it looks like it's not used in the calculation. Yeah, it it, it, the way they apply apportionment. But remember, it is still necessary to fill it in the forms. They will require it um, because they want to always check the caps that's applicable. The figures always have to be supplied. So yeah, it, it, to us, it looks like why is it necessary to have your, but as long as you're passing the threshold, right? But I understand what you're saying. But the thing is, in the form, you still got to provide it. And you've got it to still give an employer certificate as well. Yeah. yeah thanks. All right. I have, yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask a quick question. In terms of some, you know, um, workplaces where perhaps the person who has been um, in that accident and now cannot work for that, uh, let's say, particular three months. But mm -hmm. You will find out that there is actually accommodation for someone like that in that particular workplace, and he continues to get his earnings as you know per usual. But the company has to perhaps outsource someone who's going to uh, replace that particular person for that duration whilst they are away, so they are losing uh, basically. So I want to ask: uh, Can such a person earning uh, his regular salary or income still claim from? Uh, Sorry, I didn't get your last per part. Can such a person what? So, Prof, uh, isn't it that they cannot work? But yeah, yeah. If you if you sick or you ill, for example, right? Let, so we're not talking about the employer. We're not worried about the the RAF doesn't worry about what happens to the employee. He's only worried about the claimant. So if the claimant, let's just say, is sick sick for three months. And um, let's say he's used up one month already was used up for sick leave. And now two months that company said, sorry, but we're not paying you for this two months now. Um, then you remember the person, the person who's injured has now lost that two month salary and they can claim that two month salary. Did I, did I answer what what you were asking? OK, perfect. Yeah. All right. OK, so section 17 for um, dealing with loss of support. Again, remember the tables. Uh, we use the exact same tables there. Right in the beginning, it was limited to 160. And um, that lady already asked this question um, where she said, where we, did, where, where, where we did say that actually the entire family has to share that 160. And remember, we said also that two shares or two parts applies to the adult or the parent and one part or one share for the child. So yes, unfortunately, the whole family, entire family and all dependents have to share that 160,000 rand or adjusted amount. Um, you can have a look at your table, which is not actually a table, but uh, listed figures there with regard to the adjustment. Um, and the amounts are adjusted quarterly. Basically, look at it immediately prior towards the date of cause of action. I have already stated that. So that slide is now done. OK, before I move on, any questions again? <laughs> Prof, can I ask um, yeah. if, OK, there's a single accident, but two families were involved in that accident. Yeah. Do the two families each have their own claim against the RAF? So in other words, are these two families in two different vehicles? Um, even so, or in even the one, the even if it's in the one vehicle, or yeah, it could, yeah, yeah, yes, no, each family has each family in their own right can claim. Each single person can claim. Like remember the the car, the one colleague asked yesterday that if they're the passengers in the bus and the yes. one is a driver, yeah, every single passenger in the bus can claim. Even every diver can claim. The only time where the RAF is going to say we're not paying you out is. When there's a single motor vehicle accident and the driver himself um, has an accident with a tree or a lamppost or something, and it's entirely his fault. In that situation, the RAF is going to okay. say you're the author of your own misfortune. But let's just say that single driver, single motor vehicle accident, 
he had the accident for some other unlawful act, like let's just say the spare tire went on the road and he swerved and crashed into a tree. There, he's not the owner, he's not the author of his own misfortune, but there was another unlawful act and therefore he can claim. But generally, everybody can claim. Thank you. Thank you. To last, All right. to last prof, prof. Yeah. Hello. Yes, I remember, yes. although I didn't listen, I was not in the class yesterday, but I realized that you mentioning that a driver must be liable. So, uh, official didn't know now. Let's say maybe there was a stone rolling over the windscreen and then the driver, mm. and then that's what happened. So, the cause was not actually that the driver was negligent, but uh, yeah, the, there was a natural cause. Then how do, how yeah. do you start this? Yeah. Yeah, no, if you were here yesterday, we had a long discussion about this and they did understand it. So that would fall under another unlawful act. So it still falls under the umbrella of conduct in a sense, and conduct or unlaw other unlawful act. So yes, you can still claim. And yes, some in, in instances, it, it doesn't even need to be physical contact also. Like you don't need to have two vehicles actually crashing into each other. The one can literally swerve and avoid the other one and crash into a pedestrian or something. So yeah, not always. Yeah, but that, that was we explained that yesterday. All right. in, a, in, a, in a single motor vehicle accident where the driver is found to be 100% uh, liable for the accident and he died, what then happens to the dependents? Yeah, he's the author of own misfortune, and that's the end of it. <laughs> so, including so, the dependents yeah. cannot learn from Ralph. Yeah, because they would say that he's the author of his own misfortune. So, interesting, you're going to see the RABS future legislation, how that will be a bit different. I'm going to explain that just now. Okay. Okay. okay All right. Right. Then I said right of recourse. There's a section, section 25, where the RAF actually has a right of recourse against the wrongdoer driver. And it's only in particular circumstances. And they actually lay it out and they say, if a motor vehicle accident was caused by a driver who was intoxicated or under the influence of drugs or whatever, and again, they go, was the sole cause of the accident. So that instance, they can go back to the driver and say, you know, we have a right of recourse against you. If the driver is not in possession of a valid driver's license, if the owner allows a person to drive his vehicle, knowing that the driver is either intoxicated or doesn't have a valid license. And then the last point, if the RAF has to pay compensation to the claimant, um, but may have a right of recourse against the wrongdoer driver. So that's just instances where they have a right to claim back from the wrongdoer. So even though they might pay another person out, another road accident victim, they can still go back to the wrongdoer driver and claim under these instances. So it's normally under intoxication and, you know, influence of drugs, etc. All right. Now the road accident fund, road accident benefit scheme. This is now proposed future legislation, and they want to implement it. Um, the final policy was approved in Parliament already. They um, have been talks about it. Government plans to align it actually with the COID Act. Um, and this is the interesting one. It they want it to be on a no fault base. So. They, in other words, it doesn't matter. The whole question of who's negligent, it doesn't even matter anymore. So going forward in future, they want it to be no fault based. So the whole question of negligence gets cut out. Um, and they will also have limitations for income, loss of income and loss of support. And they are totally, they are totally intending to scrap general damages. A lot of money that they have to actually pay out or they did in the past was with general damages. So that's why they keep trying to cap it. They keep trying to limit it. So they really want to limit it. Remember, they're always in the news. They have no money. <laughs> they always have. Um, often you hear that, you know, the sheriff went and started picking up the um, computers from their offices, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, they always in financial problems. Um, yeah, they can't pay the bills, basically. So they, there's something drastic that does need to happen. Um, and they are hoping that this future legislation will help. The benefits may be rebu reviewed from time to time. 
and the settlements in terms of this future legislation, they are saying it's not final. So it's quite similar to the COID Act, and it will be administered by the Road Accident Benefit Administrator, and that's short for RAPSA, if I could just say. Um, and it's going to basically replace the Road Accident Fund. Now, the function of the administrator is, among other things, to assist claimants with their claims. So they're trying to assist claimants, even though they do that now, to receive claims, assess them. They can either accept or reject them, and there will be stipulated periods. Um, there will be no limitations or there will be limitations on um, temporary and permanent loss of income and loss of support. So there they call loss of support known as family benefits. So it looks the picture looks very different um, from what it currently is now even. Um, oh, one of the other things that I wanted to pick out for you. Funeral costs, they want to actually limit that to 10,000. I think currently the funeral costs, they pay reasonable costs. So they pay out for reasonable things, the costs of cremation, etc. But in the future legislation, they want to limit it, and that's to 10,000 rand. Uh, somebody's got their mic on. Um, the bill also provides for prescription periods, like how we currently have now. Um, and they also have uh, times to accept and reject claims. There will be no medical and legal costs can be claimed where, in terms of handling and preparing a claim. And it also provides for an internal appeal procedure. So very much similar to COID Act, if I can say. Right, any questions before I actually give you a practice question? Any questions? Yes, I, yes, yes, I have a question. Uh, a person who is suffering from seizures, yeah, um, when they are involved in an accident, will and they are found that at that time perhaps they had a seizure. What would be now the consequences? Do they check whether the person had medicals, uh, took medication the previous day, or? Um, yeah, it's... so I know where you're going along those lines. So it's it's one of those things that deal with the element of conduct and um, whether your conduct was basically voluntary. Um, so the law says that if you had seizures, you know about your seizures and you're taking medication and let's just say one morning you forget to take it and then that is the day you have the seizure and you cause the accident. In that scenario, they're going to find the wrongdoer driver at fault because of his prior conduct in other words the omission of taking the medication right but if for example the person never knew he had a problem but all of a sudden now he gets a seizure then his conduct is not con it's, it's now involuntary so there the person is already not delictually liable even so even from basic rules of law of delict the person's not liable does that answer it yes it does thanks all right okay now let's see if you actually understood everything that I said. There's an, a practice question. Obviously, you're not going to be able to draft everything that we want you to require. We're not asking you to draft, but let's just go through um, question and answer. and Let's see if we understood what we have learned so far with road accident fund claims. So in this scenario, we've got Mrs. X. She walks into your office and she tells you that her husband was killed instantly, right? So that means at the scene of the accident, the husband dies. She informs you that she has two minor children, that means under 18, born out of the marriage with her late husband. She wants to know whether she can claim as a result of this because he was supporting her and her two children. Now, question number one, which questions would you ask your client in order to establish the merits of the claim? So we're talking about merits, not quantum, right? Let's just shout out some some give me some answers what kind of questions would you be asking the date of the accident yeah has she got like a standard yeah she yes you yes that you would want to prove how would you prove that marriage certificate yeah, birth certificates of the children yeah so marriage certificate and birth certificates of the children will be required what else was the husband the 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 Let me do this. I'm going to come out of this for a second. 
and let me see some hands. Ooh. Give me a moment. Right, let's take some hands. First, the El Elvira. Yeah. Okay. What what questions? Or did you already tell us? Oh, I just said Lurka Standi, but um, we've answered that one because okay. she's got to prove she's married, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Okay. Other questions? Amahle. Okay. Any other questions, colleagues? What other questions? Let me put was the. the was the husband working what? and how old was he? How far is he in terms of reaching the retirement? I don't know. Okay, so your questions are really good. They are more relevant to quantum, but good questions. Other questions, colleagues? Whose fault when was it? did it happen? Yeah, I didn't get that again. Liability. When did it happen? Yeah, when did the accident happen? Is that what, is that what you said? If maybe any alcohol was involved, mm. uh, whether uh, you know the police report, you know, very right. good one, very good yeah. question. You'd want to find out details Life of the police, it. yeah, very good, a very important one. You need to know where was it. Oh, the police that came there was there an accident or officer's accident report um was the person was the husband if he died instantly um obviously they, they wouldn't be needing the ambulance um but, <laughs> but you want to find there. out other questions yeah there'll probably be a, also an inquest report that's required but yeah yes, those uh, sorry Okay, no, I think yeah, somebody's got their mic on and they're not aware of it. Yes, the colleague said who was negligent. So you, that's an important question. How did the accident happen? You got to try and figure out. So if the wife wasn't at the scene, she's going to probably try to find out from the police report or the police will definitely be in contact with her. Yeah, colleagues, that's brilliant. Excellent questions for uh, merits. What about quantum? One of the ladies already spoke about his employment. Remember, you're going to have to find out from the employee what was he earning, all that kind of questions. The employer will be given a form. You've got to fill in the employer uh, certificate. Um, the proof of expenses, whether he was paying any school fees yes. or anything. Yes, all those to prove. Yes, all of that would be required to prove. Remember also with quantum, it's probably funeral, funeral costs. Yeah. What about uh, the issue of the kind of marriage, whether they were married in community or out of community with profiles? Yeah, that would definitely fall under, again, more related to merits and local standard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I would so ask what is the husband's contribution to the household? Yes. Um, and then also, seriously, I'll ask for if there's any proof, a death certificate or a doctor's report that yeah. the husband will say. Yeah, whoever whoever actually filled in that report, all very relevant and very valid. Yeah, so whether, in quantum, he, he was in yeah. 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 prof. Yeah, yeah. Will I be be be, be uh, in order to 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 want to check if he didn't uh, have other responsibilities, for instance, mm, uh, other yes, yeah, other yeah, yeah. Definitely children relevant. that he have been maintaining, maybe. Yeah, his yeah. own children as well. Yeah, yep. no, good, good question. You also ascertain whether he has other insurances. Like yeah. cover. Yeah, yeah. The, those all get taken into account when they're doing quantum. Very good. Uh, prof, yeah. prof, yeah. Um, will it be in order to want to ascertain uh, in this instance if the, 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 the surviving spouse here had a hand in this, in his death somehow? Uh, are you talking about something intentional and criminal now? Yes. Or, yeah, if there no, was foul then, play, if there was oh, foul play, and somehow it points to her. Yeah, that will probably in be involved with a criminal investigation. So remember, that'll be a 
concurrent investigation with this claim probably yeah so that's like yeah now we're dealing with criminal law but concurrent with this as well still i mean yes if there's that instance where i happen to know that she is being investigated for this but she she have now briefed me to to she have now uh, uh, sort of uh, consulted with me to pursue this rough claim does it have an impact i mean if i know that there's an investigation yeah. So sometimes what might happen if it has a bearing on the quantum or the merits, then you can actually like mm. sometimes, for example, in a criminal investigation, negligence, if somebody was under the influence of alcohol, that can also give you an indication of negligence for the RAF claim, right? So mm. there you can actually state that you want to know what's happening in that case. And you can even postpone as soon as summons is issued. That is, you can postpone things until you find out what happened in that case. So, yeah, there are instances where that happens. OK, now let me get on to the next question. We answered that very well. Another practice question before we move on to public liability. So here's our question. On the 2nd of April, a collision occurs at a robot controlled intersection somewhere in Pretoria and between motor vehicle with registration number. We just made it up. Bad taxi and victim GP. Now the witnesses have stated that bad taxi didn't stop at the red robot. Now Mrs. X's same sex partner, Mr. Y, was a passenger in victim GP and was killed on impact. So it's another impact killing story. Mr. X and Mr. Y had legally adopted a 10 year old girl, Jane, and Mr. Y was the breadwinner of the household. Right. Bearing the aforesaid in mind, advise Mr. X on the following. First of all, does he have a claim against the road accident fund? And if he does, what can he claim? Yes, he does. Yes. Can claim for loss of support. And was, yes. and was loss of future it. support. Yeah, loss of support. And and what about the daughter? Now we've got a daughter involved as well. So the the and and especially since Mr. Y was the breadwinner. Yeah. So there's two dependents there actually. So there you'll have to just um show the duty of support. But you're right. Would there be any restrictions on the amount he can claim? Couldn't the uh, yeah, two, two to one ratio apply here? Yeah? yeah, two parts for the adult, one part for the daughter. That's already one sort of limitation or application. And then remember the restricted amount, whatever it is applicable for the 2nd of April 2011. That will be the amount that it will be capped at, right? Um, apart from the RAF, is there any other party he may sue? Yes, may sue the wrongdoer if he survived. Um, the ref, the, the ref may sue the wrongdoer. Okay, under what instance? Um, that would be for shock. Yeah, excellent. Okay, secondary emotional shock. Nice. OK, and then what would be the last date of lodgement of the claim and then last date for service of summons? Um, two years. Why two years? Remember, this is Once not a claim. Oh, Since it's, it's identified. Yeah. Since it's an identified. Yes, so with identified claims, how many years do you have to lodge? Three years. Three years. Great. Three years. And then it's extended to five to then issue and service your summons, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And where must the claim be lodged? Okay, so the rule Sorry. is yeah, actually, you can lodge any RAF office. It doesn't necessarily need to be a particular office. It can be any branch or office in South Africa. So it can be lodged anywhere. And then when drafting the summons, the particulars of claim, in which capacity is Mr. X going to act? 
in a personal capacity, a representative capacity. Why do you say personal? Because she also suffered the loss of uh, support. Yeah, but remember the other partner was the breadwinner. So it would be, yeah. So in other words, it's the personal capacity for the loss of support. Yeah. And then representative capacity for who? For the child. Yes. The child. Colleagues, I'm happy. I'm glad I think you're understanding the subject. Good. Any questions before we move on to public liability? Yes, can we take a break, please? All right. How's about this? It's 10 to 7. We get 10 minutes. We're coming back at 7, all of us, right? See you in 10 minutes. 10. A break Thank for you. 10. Okay, colleagues. See you soon. service of song this man around so um like i said um the plan there is to not bother people i will i will yeah. mute mute so, please yeah, I, I said mute, please. Please. I, please you know kindly what? mute please you know what you know what colleagues it's so embarrassing that at our level we cannot conduct ourselves professionally. A simple thing to mute yourself. We can't. I do agree. That. I agree with really, you. Complain in their own. Remember. Yes, it can be. I, can I, be. I think our our lecturers or ourselves, colleagues, we are too lenient. We we pay a lot of money to be in this class, and time is of important to us. Of, of the essence. Yes. We are so guys, people. We are, my, my, there's 99 or 99 plus of us in this team. Imagine if we all have to talk at the same time. What's going to happen? Exactly. Exactly. Just to be professional enough and be responsible of your muting. Nobody will do that for you. You you, you want to ask a question, you unmute, you, you finish, you mute. I mean, really. I mean, this is not a high school, by, by the way. It is not. So I, I don't know. Thing. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe somebody must just alert the principal to, or we maybe we might just have a, 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 a what can I say, a guidelines of this class classes to say these are do's and don'ts, rules. or the T's and yeah rules. Really, there must be there must be rules. People are already aware of the rules, so it's a problem because they are not following those rules. They know that you are supposed to mute. This has been communicated from the first day. Good but people. then, then, but then, the lecturers must 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 have consequences. There must be consequences. Who is it? Who is who is who is who is arranging the? Are you guys on 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 WhatsApp group? Yeah, we we are on a WhatsApp group. Uh, we, we tried to send our uh, contact details, but we were not uh, uh, put in that group. Yeah. Uh, some of us. I don't know who normally the the creator of that group has the rights. Some of us we will just ask like that yourself to be because we could be missing out, you know, in in, in sharing with other people some other mm. documents and all that. Maybe if that, person, if that person is here, they should just share the link for the WhatsApp group. It's much better than wait yes. than adding people, adding, adding. They won't get mm. them to add hundred people in a day. You know, so the link is much better. Yeah. You need to acquire the link and paste it on the chat. And I think it was the shared on the, the first lecture that we had. That's when the WhatsApp group started. So it's somewhere there on the chat for what? The first lecture that we had. Uh -huh. CCP. Yeah. Yes, CCP. It was shared there. There was a link there. But how helpful is uh, the group so far? Check, check your chats, man. I just posted the link now. It's great. And did you guys receive an email regarding Doxit, the registration and everything? Yes. No, yes. we did. 
We did. And everything is in order. Because on my side, there was the inserted an incorrect cell phone number. So I couldn't get the OTP. But I did fix it. I did email the lady there and yeah, it was fixed. Okay. I, did not receive, I received the email, not, not the OTP number. No, there on the email where you click the link, it takes you to another screen. It's like a form where you have to insert your details, like your ID number. Yeah. And then oh. there's a space for OTP. Your cell phone number is above. So if it's okay. incorrect, you can insert your OTP on that form. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah. I'm with you. Okay. And you must accept the invitation within 15, I think it's 15 working days. Oh. So in my case, I received it yesterday and they said it will expire on the 14th of March. So it's advisable when you get it, just click on that link to register. And then mm -hmm. from there, your account is created. But they said oh. they, we will have a training as well, I think in two weeks time. Oh, OK. All right. That, that makes sense. The other thing, colleagues, that I want to engage with you is to you know, I understand that we are anxious, we want to learn, but if we're going to ask questions in a chaotic manner, we are not going to benefit anything. Most of the time will be spent on, 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 on this chaoticness period. We, we need to come up with a smart way to say, when should we un ask questions? There must be a slot. You know, a systematic way of learning. There must be a slot to say, this, this 30 minutes is questioned and answers. Thing so, is, if as yeah, with each, I, or with each professor, um, like with the CCP, she requested that we just speak and interrupt her the way mm, mm. you know that she wanted it because we had she wanted that interactiveness. The, yes. Um, Pierre is saying we should actually ask her after every slide. That was yesterday, but today everyone is just popping up question hey. as she's actually in in between you know the teaching process. So you asking about 230 people to discipline themselves is really going to be a hard thing to implement, considering that now many are not even listening on us actually making these sort of suggestions. Mm. So you, you reckon that I must just live with it? <laughs> I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying <laughs> it would be hard maybe, to mm. implement what, what you're requesting. No, because we guys. Can there's, there's someone who shared the, the link. Uh, how do I really go about it now? Now that is in the click chat here. She click on the link and join the group. I just click it and it will direct you to WhatsApp and then it says join the group. That's it. That's it. Yes. Okay, join 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 chat. Yes, that's right. Join chat. Yeah, I will direct you to your WhatsApp, WhatsApp and then we'll just click click join after that. Okay. I'll try it. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, guys, um, just one question, right? Um, so is it safe for us? Like, would you, is it advice, of, uh, advice for us to start uh, with the um, assessment, like the ones under LSSA? Or, I don't know. Yeah, I think that only if you understand the uh, procedures of completely assessments, because mm -hmm. some of them are like uh, multiple choice questions. So you must yeah. just make your answers and then how do you how to go about submitting? Well, if, if you are not sure and then you submit something wrong of those ones, there's no good way to just have to wait for an appeal. Yeah. Because yeah. I, the, the last uh, introductory um, video that uh, the principal made, he kind of advised us not to start with the um, assessments so I'm just I'm just curious to know because uh, I would really love to start working on those assessments. Yeah, as soon as if possible. you are ready, if you are ready, you can start. If you are sure, because you only get one chance to submit on the mm -hmm. 2023 tab. 
not the yeah. practice ones, the ones that we have to submit around June and July. Those are the serious ones. Yeah, so I as know. Well, yeah, if you are serious that, okay, you know the work, then you can attempt. So for my side, I did all the assessments for cyber law and e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So for cyber law, I think there were six, because there's yeah. like three or four. I'm not sure, four or five, somewhere there. So it's I've done all, yeah, I've done all the cyber law ones, all of them. And then I did the e-commerce one. So upon, doing, so upon doing those tasks, uh, do they release the results immediately, just like on the um, yes, ones? That yes, yes, you get oh, the okay. mark immediately, so you will know if you passed or you failed. But oh, now okay. that that there was that email that says we don't have to do this uh, once with an SFLP, is that far? Is that uh, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. Yes, just correct. Yes. Yes. So we only right. do... just use on WhatsApp. Yeah. This class is about yes, correct. But I've, also, I've also noted, guys, that there you can actually do a supplementary also on most of those other exams, like the the main CCP. If you have failed, you can actually do a sub as well. So I'm going to try to send the link uh, on 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 WhatsApp, but you can do a sub. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Are we back? I I didn't want to interrupt you. Look like you were trying to communicate something important there. Are we 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 just okay, no problem. Are we back and ready? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, colleagues. I just want to say, you know what, congratulations for understanding a very difficult subject. The road accident fund uh, and the statute itself is not easy. Even in practice, it's complicated, um, but I can I can gather from the way you answered the questions that you did, you got the gist of it. So I'm very pleased about that. Um, you know, in the past, uh, this subject was at the forefront in law in general. Um, on the court rolls, this is the main cases that are always there, but it's been reduced so much, as you can see, from all the amendments and also the future legislation. So before, we actually, in personal injury claims, we only dealt with the road accident fund, but for the past couple of years now, they've introduced more sections to the work because the previous bread and butter of firms, which is road accident fund claims, has diminished a lot. So now um, attorneys and legal practitioners and all, they are now um, dealing with other types of personal injury claims. So anyway, to move on, we're going to start with public liability. And when dealing with personal injury claims and public liability, there's a lot of different things in play. So it can be legislation, for example, the Consumer Protection Act, or the common law is also relevant. It can be the law of delict, the law of contracts, which you will see. Remember the Constitution of the Republic applicable to absolutely everything. The chapter two, the Bill of Rights is applicable to everything. And also importantly, in the Bill of Rights, we have our Section 36, which is the limitation clause, right? I'm sure you all remember that from constitutional law. That limits the rights. Um, in terms of delictual liability, which is falls under civil liability, um, we actually dealt with this even in RAF claims. They remember we said it's also the backbone of um, RAF claims. We have to look at the law of delict. So here it's the same repetition in a sense. Conduct, there must be the lady spoke about the person with the seizure. That actually speaks towards whether that was a voluntary human act. Was the conduct actual, actually voluntary in that moment of the seizure? So conduct, remember, you can find it in the form of an omission, which is the failure to act, or a commission, which is a positive act. There's one article that I wrote in Portraits of an Electronic Journal, which is quite an interesting one. It deals with um, conduct itself, but it also I looked at various areas of the law. I looked at uh, Anglo-American law and French law. And interestingly, every single country has to have some kind of conduct, whether it's omission or commission. And they have very similar things about what is uh, cons what constitutes voluntary human conduct as well. Then wrongfulness, if you remember from your law of delict, um, it's either a breach of a legal duty to prevent harm. That is the question that's relevant in omissions or um, in terms of most of the time commissions or if you remember, 
the acto inferiorum, what does that deal with? Mainly when there's what? Let's see if anybody remembers. Personality rights, infringement of bodily integrity or pharma or person's good name, etc. Right. So it could be a positive infringement of a right. Um, in the past, the test everywhere the courts were going on about the bony mores. Very recently, the courts have been saying besides the bony mores test, what is the, the bony mores test actually? It's the. Um, it's the, yes, the legal convictions of society. So the but what does the society believe? Yeah, is unlawful and wrongful. Um, also under wrongfulness, a lot of times public policy plays a role. It plays a role in limiting liability in general. And lately the courts, the test that they like to use for wrongfulness is whether it is reasonable to hold the wrongdoer liable for the wrongful conduct. So that's basic test for wrongfulness. Then remember fault, fault deals. Um, there's two legs to fault. It can either be intention or it can be negligence. Um, remember, we already spoke about the reasonable person test. That's for negligence. And then with intention, you get three forms of intention. Uh, accountability is a prerequisite. Remember, we spoke about children that are under the age of seven. They are held unaccountable. So even if they commit any kind of act, they will never be accountable. So fault will al already be absent and there will be no um, delict, in fact. In the form of intention, there there's two legs again. It's direction of the will. And then secondly, consciousness of wrongfulness or rather unreasonableness. Um, yes, we spoke about the reasonable person. There's another article that I wrote again. And there the one lady very nicely said that when we're dealing with a doctor, we deal with a reasonable doctor. When we're dealing with a driver, it's the reasonable driver. So the test basically gets adjusted, but it still falls on reasonable preventability of harm, uh, foreseeability of harm, first of all, and then whether if you did foresee the harm, did you take steps to prevent it? If you didn't, then you would be negligent. Causation, remember we spoke about, it's factual causation first, and that is the easy one to always find, and there they use the sine qua non or the but for test, and legal causation whether there is a close enough relationship between the wrongdoer's conduct and its consequence, right, consequence or consequences to be imputed to the wrongdoer. And there they use in view of policy considerations based on reasonableness, fairness and justice. But the test of causation, it comes down to remoteness of damage. Was the damage too remote? How close was the damage to the conduct? And then harm or loss? We've sort of dealt with it already in the RAF claims, just the basic ones. You get pecuniary or um, special or general damages. That's the type of harm and the type of loss that you can claim. And so that was delictual liability. You still following me? Yes. yes. OK, now it's becoming too easy for you guys. <laughs> Right. Requirements for a valid contract. So this is when we're dealing with contractual liability in the public sphere, right? Remember with a contract, again, these are very basic things from your law of contract. There must be an agreement and there is the consensus of minds, right, between the parties to create that binding obligation. Um, the parties obviously must have the capacity co to contract. Remember, like a minor doesn't have full legal capacity. The performance must be possible and the contract must be lawful. And there again, it says it must not be contra bonus mores or basically not against public policy. And the prescribed formalities must be complied with. And there, there are some instances where statutes say that certain things must be in writing. Right, defenses to liability. In other words, either you're limiting the liability or you are completely excluding it, whether it's delict or in contracts. Um, so, for example, in the law of delict, the defenses that could be raised are, you could say, um, do you remember from the law of delict? 
uh, grounds of justification. Do you remember that? Yes. yes. Yeah. So ground of justification, they normally cancel wrongfulness and then you get contributory fault, which cancels or at least apportions the damage, but that deals with fault. So grounds of justification are consent, volenti, non fit in vera, which is consent to the risk of injury, um, private defense, necessity, provocation, there's statutory authority, and then we've already we've dealt with apportionment of damages act as well. So of importance to personal injury claims and contractual liability, just in a general sense, right? Um, there are issues that arise and that they might be um, where a party might try to enforce. Remember in the contract, there'll be certain things. They'll say I have exemption clauses um, and they'll have indemnities. We're indemnifying so and so from this. So all these clauses will be in there. And normally a party does that when they want to limit liability. So sometimes you let's just say you want to go. Uh, to a, a park where it's like the valley of waves or whatever, and you've got to go down slides and some of them are dangerous and they might say, OK, we need you to find sign this disclaimer form. So that obviously deals with contractual liability and there they're trying to limit their liability. Um, what is important is to always identify the correct defendant or defendants when you're issuing summons. Remember that when you're citing your parties, you have to cite them correctly. You must know who you are citing there as your defendant. And there I said, look at paragraph 19.21. Um, a public or a private or state entity, remember, is still a juristic person. And they are treated as a normal defendant, but they can be held vicariously liable with the employee. So if the employee is the one who commits the delict, um, for example, while in the course and scope of employment, then you can also cite the company or whatever the case may be. Let's, let's just take talking. We're talking about the water park. They can also be cited as being liable and they would be the co-defendants. And obviously at the end in your prayer, you would say, if you'd like to hold such and such jointly and severally liable. So important to remember who's the parties, especially your defendants. Um, they deal with municipality cases in your guide, and that's under paragraph 19.3.1. So with delictual liability of the municipality, again, when we look at conduct, right, most of the municipality cases, they deal with it in the form of omission. Um, most of the time it's failing to repair the pothole. The wrongfulness is in the breach of the legal duty to prevent harm. Remember that goes with omissions. And lately the courts have been using, is it reasonable to hold a wrongdoer liable? In terms of fault, it's usually in the form of negligence. And then with causation, that's always present. And then the harm can be either pecuniary or non-pecuniary loss. Um, defendants include the, the SANREL, which is the South African National Roads Association, as well as the municipality. So it's possible that um, both of those would be cited as the defendants. Whenever you are dealing with an organ of state, you're suing an organ of state, let's put it that way. Um, in your delictual claim, remember, you have to, the actual, um, there's an act, I think, what is it called? Something, something, organs of state. Um, that one states that within six months from the date of cause and action, you must actually notify the organ of state. I think we're going to come to that a bit later on as well. In the slip and fall cases, that's like, you remember your classic supermarket case where there's oil on the surface of the floor and the person slips and falls. Those are the, they call them the slip and fall cases. That's paragraph 19.3.2. There, the conduct is usually in the form of an omission again, and that is because they didn't have a procedure in place to keep the floor clean, basically. It can be that they have a procedure every couple of hours, somebody goes and checks on it, or when something is reported, they've got to clean it, but they have that actual legal duty to make sure that they keep it clean, dry, and most importantly, in a safe condition. So the courts will look at whether there's adequate cleaning methods were employed, whether the conduct of the supermarket, and that is obviously through their employees or their contract workers were cleaning the floor. And so remember with omission, you're normally dealing with negligence as well. 
you will easily find causation as well. And um, with negligence, when you're citing negligence, do you do you know how particulars of claim have drafted? Have you seen any? Have you seen some particulars of claim? Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. So if you haven't, or if yes. you have, right? If you haven't in your guide, normally at the end of each section, they do actually provide you with um, precedents, if I could say, which are quite nice precedents. So there, when they state the negligence, they say the person failed to keep the coral clean, or the person failed to take steps to prevent the harm, or failed to put up a sign, or failed to ensure that the water was free of um, any substances or oily liquids, etc. So it's always when they're looking at negligence, then they like to cite it in that way. Failure, failure, failure to do such and such and such. Um, with regard to schools, that's paragraph 19.3.4. Now, whether you're dealing with a private or a public school, again, it's and most of the time the conduct you will find is in the form of an omission. The wrongfulness, again, because you're dealing with omission, is based on the legal duties, the legal duties to prevent harm. So that's how they would find wrongfulness there. Um, where there was the case of Rue versus Minister of Executive Council of the Department of Education. And this dealt with actually um, some children playing rugby. And in establishing wrongfulness, so what happened, there was a scrum and the scrum fell, but basically there was also some intentional conduct from one of the players. There was provocation involved, I think. But there the reasonableness of the conduct is taken into account, right? And when you're dealing with sports and games in schools in general, they look at the rules of the game. So it would be the rules of rugby, et cetera, or the rules of soccer. And if the conduct of the players is reasonable and the rules of the game are followed, um, then the injuries might be, basically it would be consensual. If, if not, if it's gone beyond the ground of justification, now beyond consent, then the, the school could be held liable. Um, in certain instances, the part one party, instead of, so we would say consent, but here it would be consent in volenti non fitinuira. Why would I say volenti non fitinuira? Tell me. Is Why is injury? Yes, so they are basically, when you're playing a sport in school or even professionally, um, you played consenting to the risk of re injury because that is something that there is always that risk. So if you're playing especially rugby or soccer, the risk of falling down is quite high. So you generally you go in consenting to that, but that is only if the rules of the game are followed, right? So if the rules of the game are not followed, for example, there's a lot of fouls going on or somebody intentionally harms someone then, they cannot be a ground of justification and the person who's injured cannot, they cannot, um, the other party cannot say, oh, no, but he consented to the risk of injury. You understand? Yes. Okay. Can, can, can I ask? Yeah, I so I've been ask. waiting for a question. I'm getting okay. worried now. You're too quiet. So can Wait. the punishment uh, to the wrongdoer go beyond the rules of the game. Like in soccer, if the foul is not bad, you get a mm -hmm. yellow card. And then if it's bad, yes. you get a red card. So can yeah. you be punished like that? And then again, uh, with uh, court papers and everything. So remember with the yellow cards and the red cards, that's the rules of the game, right? But in this one case of Rue, um, in this one, it was a rugby scrum and the I can't remember exact facts years ago, but what I do remember, there was one of the players intentionally did something to make the scrum fall, for example. So that was not according to the rules of the game. But yeah, yellow cards, red cards, they, that's still part of the rules of the game. So, so I, want, I wanted yeah. to ask. Amen. Um, Amen. But it's more, more related to the ac uh, road accidents. Um, so let's say you're driving and you drive through a pothole and someone and you drive into someone because of that. Um, that person sues you for damages to their car and physical and what whatever. Can you on the same incident then claim 
and sue the department of roads for not fixing yeah. that drug or how do how do you go about because same with the school is it oh okay so so it's they don't see it as one case it's separate if it's, if it's complicated like what you just explained yeah if it's an instance where there's no personal injury involved at all but you're just driving on the road and now you're you've got damage to your vehicle because of potholes then you know you're just suing the municipality or whatever but now the moment you add personal injuries then you involve in the road accident fund and if it's a damages claim now then that's a separate claim in terms of common law so you can have concurrent claims okay but if someone if you drive into someone else as a result of that and they put in a claim against you and you know it's not your it was the road that wasn't fixed that's why the accident was caused can you then in the same case put a claim into to the roads department then it should actually yes. be that payment against the roads department yes. and so okay. yes like coid act where they will set off any amounts that do get paid etc yeah that would apply i think they don't even pay general damages when it comes to potholes and stuff yeah there's very, there's some extreme limitations there yeah okay can i just chip in here um if in the case of rugby there's just been a court case recently where damages have been awarded because it was at a school there was rugby um a boy was injured the paramedics came onto the field but they didn't bring the stretcher so what happened is that the boy broke his neck and he's paralyzed for life and he sued the school and um so in actual fact there's two things the referee should be able to control the game so that they shouldn't have to prevent damage so in that case can you also um sue the referee yeah, or the school can. so it's like saying when when remember when you're issuing summons you want to put everybody in there whoever was involved yeah. in that so if the referee was involved you include him as a defendant the school as the defendant if the paramedics were at fault they are defendant there's there's no limit to the amount of people that you can sue in fact it is being a good yeah. practitioner if you actually think and make sure you include everybody okay i yeah. think the minister of education was actually yes, sued in this also, case yeah, 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 that too. Okay, um, so continuing with public liability, there are a number of factors. Um, remember, we keep going back to wrongfulness, presence of a legal duty. Um, if you remember from your notes of the law of delict, some of the factors, in other words, in order to establish whether there was a legal duty to prevent harm, some of the factors that assist in finding that legal duty is things like prior conduct remember the story about person who starts a fire and then they don't put it off that's prior conduct a particular office control over a dangerous object especially like a gun rules of law foreseeability of harm which lately they're saying shouldn't fall under wrongfulness one of the courts said that um, a special relationship between the parties social and economic concerns contractual undertaking for the safety of a person um, the creation of an impression that the interests of the third party will be protected. And um, remember, I said recently, in terms of wrongfulness, the courts have been staking and they're re reiterating it in many constitutional courts cases where they're saying the test for wrongfulness is whether it's reasonable to hold the wrongdoer liable. Um, so the, they haven't thrown away or gotten rid of the Boni Mores test. It's still there. Um, but now lately, almost like to end off the test for wrongfulness, they state, is it reasonable to hold the wrongdoer liable? And often in pleadings, what happens, um, I think you'll come across it, that they'll state there was a breach of a duty of care. I want to just tell you this, that um, the concept of duty of care, that stems from English law. So South African law, we don't like to say duty of care, but we rather say breach of a legal duty. So um, a lot of summons, I think even there are some court cases where, the, where the, the judges will actually state that, no, why is this person now bringing this in the particulars of claim? So just bear that in mind in your particulars of claim when you're dealing with wrongfulness, state rather there's a breach of a legal duty, not the duty of care. You understand? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Some yes. examples yes. of pleadings. Sorry, Prof. You said uh, breach of legal duty. Legal duty. duty yeah. So it's Nine. a breach of a legal duty. In South African law, we re rather refer to that. Okay, and there's some really nice examples of pleadings in your guide, which you can go through, and that's from paragraph 19.35 and 19.36. Okay, now coming to this really important one about disclaimers, indemnities, and exemption clauses. Now, this is mentioned in paragraph 19.4. So before the enactment, enactment of the Constitution, right, um, the Consumer Protection Act was still there and is still uh, applicable as well. Um, the exemption clauses, so before the Constitution, the exemption clauses were binding, right, as long as, and this is what they said, if it's clear and unambiguous, and it wasn't generally against public policy. So even though the clauses might have been really harsh, for example, there's the case in your notes of Afrox, where they found the hospital not liable, um, and Durban Water Wonderland, where they found the amusement park not liable. They got away with it because they said, no, it was clear and ambiguous. So if they had notices up saying, we will not be held liable if any injury befalls you using our slides or our amusement park or whatever the case may be, then they were not held liable. They got away with it. But since the Constitution and since they've been using um, the Chapter 2 Bill of Rights as well and they've been referring to it. So, for example, in the case of Swinburne, um, which is 2010, there the ex exemption clause was found to be ambiguous and it wasn't enforced. And there the court actually found the landlord to be liable. I think it was a case of where they hadn't looked after the staircase and they had an indemnity clause that said they cannot be held liable. And in that case, the court said, no, that's not on anymore. So nowadays, because of the Constitution, the principles of fairness, reasonableness and justice play a role. And that's now becoming really more prominent in contractual liability. So even though you now have this freedom co to contract, um, you've got to make sure no matter what, that whatever clause you have is always fair, reasonable and just. And there's a nice example in your notes, Naidu versus Birchwood Hotel. Now, in this one here, um, Mr. Naidu actually got injured by a gate falling on him as, uh, as he was approaching an entrance and he sustained some bodily injuries. Now, what happened was prior to that, um, he had signed an indemnity clause. I think it's something there when you enter and it basically that indemnity clause says it's absolving the hotel from any negligence and any form of damages caused or resulting on the hotel premises. And that was contained not only in the hotel register that he signed, but there was also some kind of notice up, I believe. Now, the court found in this case that the hotel was negligent and that their attempt to use that clause was not on. So that was not going to be held up to exclude liability. So that has been um, and that was also applied in Duffy versus Lillifontaine School. So lately, even though there are those clauses and they are clear and they are ambiguous, the courts are looking at fairness, reasonableness and justice. And if they find that, no, these clauses, even though they are clear and they posted everywhere, that doesn't mean anything. The clause itself must still be reasonable. So that's the direction that they have been taking lately. Uh, before we get on to Prasa, any questions? Alex, you still with me? Yeah, we 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 we're with you. Okay. I'm, I'm, you said the court, the court is looking at fairness, reasonableness, and justice. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we've got um, the Passenger Rail Association of South Africa. Oh. That's now in paragraph twenty of your notes. And here, um, what's important is to actually look at the duties of Prasa. The duty of PRASA to the actual commuters, the people that actually use the trains or whatever. And there they have to take reasonable steps. So there again, reasonable plays a very important part. It's reasonable in, implenti in implementing their policies, in terms of their procedures, in terms of their operating manuals, all of that. Um, 
they've got to take reasonable steps in a number of things, keeping things safe, the doors must be closed, that kind of thing. There's a lot of cases that come, come to the court normally because the doors don't close and a person is easily able to open it and basically can fall out and get injured. Um, there's some really weird cases where on the train itself, um, you might get some, there was a case where somebody just knifed a passenger um, and there they, the court said that, hang on, you know, there should be people actually monitoring the trains as well. So they do have certain um, duties that they must comply with. So when you're dealing with PRASA, there the prescription is three years. And remember, like road accident fund, it's first, in, first day is included. The last day is excluded. Now, important thing, summons must be served at their principal place of business, and that is in Johannesburg. So that's PRASA, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, um, Jansi, can somebody tell me how do you pronounce that? House, Walmeran, Strat, Bramfontein. <clears throat> Janchi. Janchi. Hey, you said it so nice. Janchi, I will not forget it. Thank you. <laughs> and then conduct. So with PRASA, conduct again, like all the other cases with liability, it's normally in the form of omission. Wrongfulness is the breach of the legal duty, and that's to keep the doors closed a lot of the time to ensure that the passengers are safe that they place guards there and that they provide adequate supervision, right? So that's when wrongfulness normally comes in. And that's what's cited in a lot of the particulars of claim. And then with negligence also, they will cite and say that there was, um, they should have foreseen the harm and they should have prevented the harm from occurring. And again, we use the reasonable person for the test for negligence, causation, um, a but for test for factual causation and then the flexible test for legal causation. So the but for test, would the injuries have occurred if the train door wasn't closed? That's just a hypothetical um, example. Um, with legal causation, was there a close enough relationship between the wrongdoer's conduct and its consequences for that consequence to be important to the wrongdoer? Um, in terms of reasonableness, fairness, and justice. And of course, there must be harm. So again, can you see basic delictual principles there? Do you follow? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes Paul. Okay, and then um, paragraph 20, you can have a look at the cases that are referred to there in your practice manual. Uh, good cases to look at is Mashongwa, Mokwena, um, Seti, those are good cases to look at. Um, also, the defences that are applicable is exact same ones you find in the law of delict that might be applicable that, again, volenti non fitinuira, which is consent to the risk of injury, or they can say that there was contributory negligence on the part of the commuter. So that's, those are the defences that PRASA would probably try to raise, or actually they do raise it in all of this, uh, their pleas. Um, requirements for consent, if you remember from law of delict, the consent, and this applies also to consent to the risk of injury. So either consent or consent to the risk of injury, the consent must be given freely and voluntary by a person capable of volition. The commuter himself or herself must have knowledge and realize the nature and extent of the harm. And the commuter must actually consent to that risk of harm. And the consent cannot be contra bonus mores. Um, an example. Can anyone think of an example of something being contra bonus mores? Yeah, I remember. I think there was a case um, that related to some employee at one, uh, um, I think one, uh, um a flight uh, so this person i think did something and then um in order for her uh, to escape uh, of, from being fired uh, mm -hmm. she, uh, she 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 accident to one manager to touch a bomb or assault her in one form or the other but then later it was found oh. that that concert was done yeah uh, yeah, sure. yeah yeah okay yeah 
So another example of, you know, when they talk about contra books, like they say a contract cannot be contra bonus mores, for example, like another idea or another example rather is that you cannot sign a, a contract or an indemnity form stating that um, you consent to the risk of injury of, you know, death, for example. So you cannot consent to that. So that would be considered contra bonus mores, and that can never be in contracts. If it is in contracts, it cannot even be taken into account. So that's always uh, important there with, with contract law as well as delictual liability. Um, in instances where the person so, jumps on, yeah, you had a question? So even, okay, so even if it's a, like a, a risk factor in terms of uh, medical uh, in, intervention, that you may die, but it's not that you will die, but that's one of the risk factors. Oh, no. In in that instance now, when we're dealing with medical procedures, it's very normal. It, that would not be considered contra bonus mores because it is very normal in um, operations to state that there is that risk that, um, you know, you can die. But the doctor, there's duties upon the doctor. The doctor must actually inform the patient of this. So he has that duty to state that this is your condition, this is the treatment that we plan, um, this is the risks that are involved, and these are the major risks or whatever the case may be. If the person has a particular predisposition, I don't know, they've got allergy to certain type of medicines or whatever, the doctor must know that and you know state that, okay, then we cannot do this, so we cannot use that medication, etc. So the doctor has those duties. But there, the society wouldn't say that it's contra bonus mores because that is a normal thing that does happen. So when I'm talking about contracts, I'm talking about like, you know, sometimes you can, I think it's the compactum de comprendendo, comprendendo. It's a, um, a Latin term that basically where you have a contract and you, you in the contract, for example, you want to state that I consent to dying, basically, um, or I consent to being murdered or consent, those are basically considered contra bonus mores. So in, in law, they say generally you cannot, the rule is you cannot consent to serious injury or death, but in the cases of medical procedure, which you brought up so nicely, that actually happens quite often. That risk is 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 there and prevalent all the time. Prof, the example of a uh, contra bonus mores is like, for example, you contract to do a duel and yes. the duel will be that I can kill you in the yeah. duel. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, very nice example. Nice example of contra bonus mores. The other one is when the employer uh, strikes a, a female worker not to fall pregnant during probation. What is this to do with exactly? What do you mean must fall pregnant during I'm, probation? I'm, I'm saying in, in the contractual. Oh, um, yes, you employment. can't others have a contract. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, stuff like that. OK, no, I get you. Um, OK, so anyway, with with passengers on a train, for example, right, let's just say the person intentionally now jumps onto a moving train or jumps off the train. So in those cases, um, even though we're dealing with intention, the court can agree that the plaintiff consented to the risk of injury, and that could apply as a defense, or they can say that the person, there was contributory negligence on his part. I think there was a particular case where somebody had missed their stop and um, just opened the door and jumped off, and in that got very badly injured. So there they said, okay, even though Prasa is at fault, um, the actual commuter was also at fault for intentionally jumping off. Um, those are some of the defenses that can apply, at least to limit liability. Um, now, what's happening here? My page down. Whoa. What's happening to my screen? OK, and I just want to have a look at something, colleagues. I don't know what's going on with the screen at the moment. OK, no, that was just a blank page. Unlawful arrest. Let me begin the slide there. It was just a blank page. Got yeah, I got worried. <laughs> I thought, what's happening to the screen? 
OK, unlawful assault and arrest. Now that's under paragraph 21. Um, can anyone give me an example of that? Common examples. If you arrest someone without uh, reading them their rights, that will be an unlawful arrest. Mm -hmm. Also, um, where the person actually didn't commit the crime and you thought that they did commit the crime and they were wrongfully arrested or there wasn't enough evidence, etc. But yeah, good examples. So the yeah, that can also be that can occur as well. Um, there they should when, have done a due diligence. Yeah. When we inflict uh, oh. violence in order to seek confession or admission of the offense from the suspect. Yeah, so that um, definitely deals with like um, forcing somebody. Am I am I right? Is that what you're going along those lines? And it's yes. not done in the correct manner. Yeah. Yes. So under yes. unlawful. Yeah. Prof. Can, you, can you raise an un un unlawful arrest if it, there was a circumstantial evidence? In other words, you know, the thing is that if you um, I, I'm not very clued up, to be honest, on criminal law, right? But as far as I know, um, we are dealing with cases where it's then proven that the person didn't commit the crime because and they didn't have enough evidence and that person is now um, unlawfully held against their will. So their right of freedom is taken away in a sense or it's infringed rather. And I think that besides being a delictual right, it's a constitutional right. Because the moment you arrest somebody, you are infringing their right to freedom of movement, right? And in those cases, it's not something that the courts take lightly, that you can't just go around arresting people. It, everything must be done with procedures. And there they look at the procedures that are followed. And obviously, one of the things is that you cannot... You cannot arrest someone just on circumstantial evidence. You've got to have something hard. And even when you do arrest them, remember there's that, am I not mistaken, that 48 hour rule that you've got to comply with? Um, yes. Yeah. Before the yeah. Intercourt, yeah. 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 So normally what happens with this unlawful assault and arrest, um, there's always positive conduct, conduct because there you're physically um, putting somebody behind bars, literally. Um, so the positive convert comes into play. It's not an omission. And the wrongfulness is now not the breach of the legal duty to prevent harm, but rather it's the infringement of the right to bodily and physical integrity. And in respect of arrest, it's infringement of the right to physical liberty. So those are the rights that are infringed, right, in terms of wrongfulness. And that is a positive conduct there. And it can lead to delictual liability on two fronts. So it either can be the act in Nuriarum or it can be the action as well. So it can be both. You can claim according to act in Nuriarum or action for pain and suffering as well. And the fault can be present in the form of intention or negligence in respect of that. Sometimes it can be that they intentionally arrested or it was also in terms of negligence. They hadn't done their duty there. And the assault may be accompanied by violence or not necessarily. It can be with or without pain. And the harm itself can even be trivial. Trivial meaning really minor. OK, so an employer under unlawful assault and arrest, an employer may be held vicariously liable. Um, the delict committed, remember I said earlier with the employee, the delict is committed in the course and scope of employment. One important thing I think which I didn't mention earlier is that one of the requirements is there must always be that employer-employee relationship to hold the employer vicariously liable. There has to be that relationship. And the uh, employer is usually the person with the deeper pocket. And um, when you're citing them in your particulars of claim, you will cite like how the lady asked about, I think it was the rugby claim, um, can be the minister of education, it can be the school, it can be the referee. You will try and rope in as many people there as your defendants. Um, does anybody remember the case of F versus Minister of Safety and Security from your law of delict? I think it's mainly in the law of delict that they've dealt with it. Does anybody remember that case? It was such an important case. 
it started off in yeah it started off in the high court it went to the supreme court and finally the constitutional court and this case was followed by everybody because in every single um, different court, they had a different opinion as to whether the minister was held liable or not. But in finally, the constitutional court held that the minister of safety and security was liable. It was a tragic case of this young girl that was actually raped by police officers. They were on standby duty, so they were not actually in a uniform. They were not in a marked car. But they, so I think they tried to get away, the minister tried to get away from liability, stating that um, they cannot be held vicariously liable because these people were acting on a frolic of their own and it was not while they were in employment. But according to this facts, actually, they were on standby duty, meaning at any time they had to be available. And then the courts went, dug a bit deeper and said, but listen, you know, even the policemen themselves, their whole morale and everything is to uphold the law. And um, they found the minister vicariously liable in this case. There's also instances like Car Michelle, um, where and other cases as well, where the police officers were having control over a dangerous object, having control over a gun. And then, for example, in one case, they went home and shot, I think it was the wife and children in that and the neighbor as well who tried to be the hero to rescue the family from this um, husband that was at the time um, not in the right frame of mind. But he had used his position being the policeman and his gun, which the minister had actually um, given to him to use in his duties. And there also the minister can be held liable. So again, it just depends on whether the requirements of vicarious liability were met. Um, in terms of defences, do you all remember provocation? Do you know what? Do you remember provocation yes. as a defence? So yes, provocation, okay. yes, provocation yeah. is a defence, but it's not considered as a defence that excludes liability. It's more like a, a defense that mitigates things. It mitigates the circumstances, if I could say. So it's um, not a complete defense, but it's a partial defense in a sense. Um, and that's dealt with 20, paragraph 21.6.6. .6. Do you remember self-defense from law of delict? Yes. 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 But you mustn't so, exceed the limits. Yes. You're right. You mustn't. There must be proportionality, basically. Yeah, you mustn't exceed those reasonable limits, in other words. So there, there's also requirements. Another thing to remember in practice, colleagues, whenever anyone raises a defense, number one, go and look at the requirements. What was the requirements for the defense? That's your starting point. What is the area of law? Go and look at the defense and look at the requirements because every defense has separate requirements. They might have um, common things with regard to wrongfulness, etc., but they will all have different requirements. So important to look at that. So for defense, for example, you must plead in your particulars of claim and you also have to prove that the attack was unlawful on the defendant, um, that there were reasonable grounds for the defendant to believe that he was in danger and that the forced use was reasonable and necessary under the circumstances. And there the courts will look at proportionality. Was the forced use in proportion? Do you remember from your law of delict? I remember in your exams a very famous question. They always ask the question, um, X slaps Y. No, X verbally um, calls Y a name and Y retaliates by slapping the person. Do you remember that one? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, so we there do. they say it's out of proportion because the one person acted verbally and the other person acted physically. So in that situation, they say you've exceeded the bounds of reasonableness, in other words, and proportionality is lacking. And there you cannot use that defense. Sorry, ma'am. Um, can I ask something? What if um, the other one slips, say X slips um, Y and Y takes out a knife and stabs um X, what happens yeah. in that case? Out of proportion, isn't it? It's sort of like verbally assaulting and then physically assaulting. So in other words, if a slap retaliates with a slap, then they would say that is in proportion, right? 
But if yes. it's a slap and then somebody brings out a knife and stabs, obviously that now becomes out of proportion. So yeah, okay. then you won't be able to rely yeah. on defense, well, basically. Uh, well, I, I think, but they will also look, say if maybe it's a guy, a bodybuilder who slaps a lady, then a lady takes a knife, then I think the lady will not be uh, exceeding the bounds of a... Uh, uh, like it you will be balancing be, right? out. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in a sense, the court will look at proportionality because the lady might, obviously, she's not in the same physical strength as the bodybuilder and her only thing at the deposed, her disposal was maybe a knife. But they, again, it's a very fine line and the courts will look at proportionality and they will also look at the circumstances surrounding at the time. Yeah, so it will be like they will put the put yourself in the shoes of that person as well yeah so I'm yeah sorry, possibly, yeah um what's gonna happen if um someone uses a gun and shoots my leg and then i retaliate by using a knife and i stab yeah, his, i mean i i, I stab his chest and then he dies yeah so yeah. remember with okay so besides proportionality right one important thing to always remember, remember that in law they say that right to life is paramount and importance to uh, paramount and important to a person. So in other words, my life is so important to me. OK, so even if somebody comes and attacks me um, holding a gun, they haven't yet shot, but I quickly take out a knife and I stab him. Then in that situation, I took the decision in that moment out of necessity, right, that I uh, or private defense or necessity, whatever the case may be, that I now needed to protect myself. And in that situation, the courts will look at it and, and judge it. But again, Hello, yeah, Prof. it's, yeah. Yes, I remember there was a case law, I cannot, cannot have a good uh, citation, but I was just reading article when the presiding officer was sending a, a sentence. Now I just want to get a clear, a clear situation, a clarification. You know, one uh, was, uh, was assaulted and then he went home to get a, a weapon and come back and kill the person so he said by the time you went home mm. you would have been come down and everything yes. and then yeah so is that uh, was that a uh, let's just find out more about it out of proportion in, in that sense also um and unreasonable in that sense because yes the person there's the space of time involved in other words yeah you're right. There was a yeah. time involved. I, I think the, the, the case is raising it, it's it's quite controversial. I, if I recall it's it's a it's a Mukoshane case. In my view, uh, because I think the 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 courts uh, stated that it was self defense in that situation. And perhaps um given some of the principles we learned, uh, such as your self defense. For me, perhaps the court might have taken uh, a wrong decision because if somebody walks away, picks, I think he picked the, um, what is it, an axe or something, and mm -hmm. then went back to the scenario. And then, yeah, so perhaps maybe uh, the, the case may be gone further. I, I think another court could have decided differently. Mm -hmm. No, I do know of case law. Um, to be honest, I don't know of actual criminal cases, but I'm talking about delictual cases. And I've read, um, I think there's a very famous English one like that as well. So in English law, they have separate torts. I think it's the tort of assault and battery. And with the um, tort of battery, one of the specific things mentioned is the time between the act and the retaliation. So if the act and retaliation, retaliation is immediate, like it's quite close in time, like we're talking about few minutes, few seconds, you know, then you can understand it. But as you said, you've got time in terms of an hour, you go home, you should have calmed down, you could have changed. It's almost in, in terms of criminal law, it's definitely becoming more intentional and more premeditated, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then um, uh, Karen, sorry, just a yeah. question. You know, you you started off this process by speaking about someone insulting you, but obviously, yeah. you know, this proportionate doesn't 
lie in that zone also because you can't say that um, I'm just asking where mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your client has, uh, you know, someone's insulted him and then he's insulted. I mean, you know, and there's now defamation on both sides. Mm. Uh, how, how would the court look at that? Because obviously it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, your, your defense is, uh, uh, I insulted him back, you know. <laughs> Yes, um, so in other words, you cannot rely on the defense when it's out of proportion, first of all, right? And um, when you're dealing with infringement of rights, um, sometimes certain rights trump other rights. Like, for example, the right to life, in a sense, trumps the right to what? Freedom of expression mm -hmm. or some another. Give me another example. The right to life is actually more important, right? So sometimes it becomes towards the balancing of interests. So wrongfulness comes into play where we talk about balancing of interests and rights. And in that also you look at what right trumps another. So it can be like how I said, the right to life trumps, trumps the right other rights. Um, if we're looking at defamation, which two rights are always in Con a contradiction with each other when you're talking about defamation. Which two rights? The main ones. What well, is it? The right, the right to dignity and the right to um, what is it? Uh, not, uh, not yeah, to 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 a personal opinion. I forget what that's called. Yeah. So it's the right to your your. It is the, the dignitas, and then on the other end of it, yeah. it's the freedom of expression. Right to free. Yes, versus right to privacy. Yes, yes, also, and then your freedom of expression as well, right? Your dignity and your freedom. So let's just say, for example, we're talking about my right to my dignity and then freedom of expression, the, like a newspaper is trying to state, we want to um, report on this particular person. Um, it's in the public interest, etc., etc. So there you've got to look. They would have a defense, for example. So you've got to look at each right and defenses that are applicable. But basically, it comes down to looking at balancing of rights and interests. If um, the defendant or the wrongdoer um, causes harm to the other party in an unreasonable manner, in an unlawful manner, and there we look at um, balancing of interests of right, anything that's out of proportion as well, any unreasonable conduct on the part of the defendant as well, um, that can apply. So yeah, balancing of rights, that's, Mostly what applies there. Yeah, following. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. OK. Yes. If, if you remember with necessity also has specific requirements. Um, paragraph 21.6.3 with necessity when you in when you are faced with a situation, right? And have you heard of the lately they use it a lot, this mayor. Um, it means a superior force or actually an act of God. They like to state that uh, sometimes. And with necessity, the person can be acting out of necessity not only to protect his interests, but that of another. If you remember from the law of Dedic, they love that question of um, somebody's fire, uh, somebody's house burning down. It's your neighbor's house and the neighbor quickly runs over and breaks the door um, to quell the fire or bring a stop to the quiet. Uh, and then they try to state, OK, but now the owner comes back and says, you broke down my door. I'm charging you for that or I'm suing you for that delictual liability. And then the other person can come and say, no, I acted out of necessity. And they remember, again, it's an interest or a right that trumps another one. So what's more important is to stop this burning house because it can continue. It could harm or injure animals, dogs, etc and people so that trumps the right over your property in other words your right to property so it's a balance and trumping of rights there again um the harm that's inflicted on the innocent person um normally the attack must be directed at the attacker and the following requirements must be met there must be that state of necessity and that also is judged objectively by the courts and um, there must be like imminent danger or something that exists at that time. And uh, in terms of grounds of justification, that is um, applicable. That's necessity and self-defense most of the time. And then I've just written uh, here. 
see justification for would, lawful arrest. Yeah. Sorry. Would, um, will will it also fall under necessity when um you kill a dog that is yes about yes. to attack you? Yeah. Okay. That is one of the classic examples also in the books. Um, if you are trying, recently there's been a lot of cases of Rottweilers as well, um, where the person, if he injures or harms the dog or even kills the dog, he can act in a sense out of necessity. Yeah. Especially pit bull. Yes. <laughs> now they are actually putting them down huh, lately. So I don't know if we're going to see the species much anymore. Very, very problematic dogs. Yes. Um, and then have a look at the Criminal Procedure Act, um, specifically Section 49. Look at paragraph 21.6.4. Um, do you know what is contumelia? Contumelia means um, a claim for damages, but it's sentimental damages for insult. That's something that is prevalent um, in the particulars of claim when you're asking in the prayers especially. It's the uh, same as criminal injuria. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And then um, we were just speaking about animals just now. So the actio de pauperi um, is a specific remedy. It, excuse me, sorry, it has specific requirements. And then the actual legus aquiliae, that is the one that we've dealing been dealing with like in most of our cases so far, where you have to have conduct, wrongfulness, fault, causation, and harm. So if you are harmed by an animal, you can use the remedy, which is either the actual legus aquila. So there, for example, if you acted out of necessity, you know, that would be your ground of justification. But you can also have, um, you can also state there or claim under the actio de pauperi. And in what's interesting about this one or this remedy is that fault is not required. So it doesn't matter whether there was negligence or any type of fault involved. So according to these requirements, basically the defendant must be the owner of the animal. The animal must be a domesticated animal and the animal must act contra naturum. In other words, it must act against its species. So um, for example, if a, do a domesticated dog bites, then they say this is uh, we always have an issue with it. We, we don't most people don't understand it, but basically they say that that is contrary to its nature, although it can be its nature to bite. But they say that that is when a dog acts out of its nature because domestic animals are supposed to be friendly, in other words. So um, in claims that um, involve animals, you can um, claim your remedy according to the Actio de Popery as well as Actio Lagus Aquiliae. The defenses that you could raise, um, at the, or, or rather the owner of the animal that could raise, he could say that the animal was provoked. Um, he could say there was voluntary insumption of risk, risk or there was contributory fault. Um, I said to see examples of particulars of um, claim. And an example would be, you know, for example, you've got a plumber that wants to come to your home. And he enters the premises without ringing the doorbell or shouting out for help. And there is a sign that says, beware of the dog. And the plumber enters, for example, and in that he is bitten and injured or harmed. So in those cases, there's not provocation, but the defense that could be raised is voluntary assumption of risk or contributory fault. Um, where provocation is raised, remember that's not a complete defense, we said before, but it's like an instance, I think there was a case where there was a child that pinched the dog's nose, for example. And the, in a kind of situation, hypothetically like that, you can state that uh, there was provocation. Okay. Prof, yeah? Prof, a question, so if it's, if it's not a domesticated animal, then you won't rely on that type of defense. No. No. What is the other um, Actio de Pastu? Do you for, remember for, that one? Do you remember from Law of Delict Actio de Pastu? Not a python, guys. <laughs> a what? A python? Yeah, for example, the tiger that bit the people, or, you know, bit someone oh, yes. in. Yeah, yeah. That's not a, that doesn't fall yes. under that. No, no. Okay. One of those requirements is one of the requirements is it must be a domesticated animal. Yeah. So that wouldn't apply. 
So yeah. that tiger, that tiger, I don't know if it's domestic, if it can be domesticated, but I'm also oh. just thinking in terms of wild and or not wild animals. For instance, a kudu, mm. a neighbor's kudu that comes into your yard and eats your vegetables. Oh. Yes. Or he well, bites your pipes or, I don't know, breaks your fence or anything, then you can't rely on that. Um, no. But what no. would you rely on? If, if, if you get herding animals that move on to the neighbor's farm, sometimes there isn't a clear fence or a boundary line and you do get animals straying onto the land of the other neighbor and they can eat the crops or crample and destroy them, for example. But what was the other remedy um, in common law, law of delict that you could have used? If you remember the Actio de Pastu, it's specifically for those types of animals, the grazing animals. Actio de Pastu. Yeah, yeah. So you have a look at that. You know what I wanted to mention? I forgot actually earlier on. Um, Amless Pleadings and Precedents. Have you, do you know about that book? Do any of you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. a very nice book yeah. to to actually have a very nice book or, or, you know, because the thing is that when you're a legal practitioner, you literally have to be a jack of all trades. Um, and, and from your own memory, you're not going to remember, oh, there's an actual de pasto that I could have used or whatever for my client. But that's a nice book to have. And um, what's nice is they have um, examples of how to cite um, things in your particulars of claims. In other words, how to cite the cause, causes and they actually, some of them actually mention the requirements, etc. So nice book to have actually. So remember, what is so the name of the book? Do you want to add that um, book's name to the chat, please? Amler's Pleadings and Precedents. Um, who does know about it? Can somebody put that in the chat so I don't come out of the screen? No problem. No problem. Okay, thank you, my dear. Thank you. That will be helpful. Um, professional negligence. Okay. Um, this one is applicable especially to legal practitioners in um, your line of work. Remember the failure by the attorney to act. Um, and they, again, they loved your, your standard is always reasonableness, right? Competent, reasonableness, again. It's expected of every member in the profession. So attorney can be liable. Um, it's normally out of contract because you have the contract with the client, right? You have the mandate and the contract with your client. So that's where it actually stems from. And also there's professional negligence. And they give you examples in your guide in paragraph 23. And I think in terms of ethics, you said you've already done it. They probably gave you examples there. Am I right? Ethics, did they explain some of that to you? Yes. Yeah. It is. So, yes. Yes. So, okay, good. So some of the things that you can be found negligent for is allowing matters to prescribe. So I shall reiterate, remember when you're dealing with a statute, check because some of them, they don't follow the Prescription Act, which applies to like normal things like delictual claims, claims, but that statute might have certain prescriptions or like when you're dealing with an organ of state, they might have particular steps that you must follow, like notifying them within six months. So just remember um, to always check on your matters. You must have a diarization system. For those of you who are not in practice yet, believe me, you're going to learn that very quickly because that's one of the things that everybody fears is any matter to prescribe, um, the failure to take proper instructions. And with that also comes with not informing your client of things, you know, where you just try and settle something without the mandate or you act without a mandate even. Um, so you, in other words, you're failing to act according to your client's um, instructions. And sometimes it can be that you didn't do it timelessly. For example, if time is of the essence, if somebody calls you and says, I'm on my deathbed and I need this will drafted because I have to exclude my son from this will. He's been terrible this past six months. So it depends. Time can be of the essence in, in terms of how you have to act. But then again, it's always about reasonableness. What is within reasonable limits and reasonable bounds? Um, the failure to act and apply according to the required skill of the profession and the knowledge that you should have. Um, so in terms of negligence, it will be the reasonable legal practitioner. That will be the standard. Okay. 
Um, and then I'm glad that at least ethics has probably dealt a lot with this. Remember earlier on, somebody, we spoke about the contingency fee agreements. Do you remember? Did you actually come across this when you did ethics by any chance? Or is that coming under another topic? No, we did it under ethics. Yes, it's under ethics. With... Okay, <coughs> so do you remember that there's basically two types, the no win, no fee, and um, you cannot charge a uh, higher, um, or you cannot charge more than the 100% basically, or the total can't be more than 25% of the capital. Do you remember all that? Yes. And there's probably an example as well in your ethics manual as well. There is one in your personal injury claims manual. Um, remember to take note of the formalities that must be complied with, and that's mentioned in your paragraph 24.2 and 24.3. And they also speak about the, or they mention the case of Masango. Um, okay, and then the last, last section is medical negligence. Medical negligence. Bobrov. Sorry? Why not mention the case of Bobrov? Um, I particularly want to steer clear of that one. <laughs> Highly oh. debated, yeah. Okay, sure. They fell from grace, believe me. They were, once somebody revered and respected, fell from grace. Okay, anyway, but ne medical negligence, right? A medical practitioner, uh, first of all, has to be registered with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. So um, you cannot even practice without that uh, practice number. And it's on, it's on all your documents. It must be stated on your documents. So the test for medical negligence, somebody already stated, it's the reasonable medical practitioner. And then to succeed with the claim for medical negligence, the following must be proved. There has to be um, a contract, okay, between the medical practitioner and the plaintiff um, or the patient. The contract is already in place. It can even be verbal. It doesn't need to be something signed. Um, negligence, obviously, the negligence standard is the reasonable doctor or reasonable med uh, medical practitioner. There should be factual and legal causation and there must be harm, obviously. Um, examples are, right, of medical negligence. Examples are delay in treating someone, failing to interpret scans correctly. Sometimes it's about misdiagnosing or even a failure to diagnose something like cancer that's prevalent, um, a failure to identify or address any complications. Sometimes it can even be that you're doing a completely unnecessary surgical procedure. Um, I think there was a case where somebody, one of the doctors um, actually, I think tied um, fallopian tubes, for example, and that was not agreed upon. Um, it could be inadequate post-op care that later on leads to complications as well. So those are just some of the examples that lead to medical negligence. If I must say, um, currently we have many, many cases um, against the minister, um, mainly because of things going wrong in hospitals, especially with babies, when the babies are born, when there's not proper care taken, um, not only in the delivery, but um, events leading up to the delivery where the doctors haven't particularly checked on the patient, like she's had high blood pressure and he doesn't check in with the nurse or he doesn't check in with the patient. And from that, the baby goes through distress or whatever the case may be. A lot of cases um, like that in, in medical, in the medical field, I think obstetricians are charged something ridiculous, like six to 800,000 Rand insurance per year just so that they can cover themselves for these type of claims. So medical negligence, actually, even though it's mentioned as such a small section in personal injury claims, it's now becoming the bread and butter for a lot of firms nowadays. Um, but I think like the RAF, the state itself is going to, um, uh, they are trying to implement or they're trying to get a statute and a bill, draft bill passed where they will start limiting um, claims against um, public health institutions. Their prescription is three years from the date of death, uh, the date the, on the date which the debt becomes due. And I said to have a look at the precedent there. Um, okay. So, sorry, ma'am, can I, can I ask a question? Um, what yeah. happens in the case whereby um, 
there's a, a power cut um, during uh, losing you. Let's say, I yeah, power cut. There was a power cut um, during um, um, surgical process. Are you are you suing both the doctor and ESCOM or the doctor it's, and the government? Oh my, I'm sure that's gonna come across. Huh? Um, some of the some sometimes what happens is um they use Vismaya in insurance claims, an act of God um that has happened. It's a defense that's applied. But yeah, really good question because even the hospital itself, they cannot normally control. But hospitals have backup stuff. They've got backup generators and things. I haven't re really um, come across a case yet, but really interesting because we are right in the midst of serious power cuts all the time. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, isn't it that uh, the contributing factor can also be a, a defense in terms of mitigating the uh, claim yeah. in terms of acquiring next year? Like, yeah. for example, uh, the pregnant man that did not uh, attend a, 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 a clinic prior to her delivery. Yeah. So she yes, just come in. Contributory yeah. Fault. yeah, yeah, you're right. They can be contributory fault on her part. It will depend on the circumstances and facts of the case. Yeah, for sure. Can, can you sue okay. the doctor or the, the state? Both. Um, you can actually and you must sue everybody that you can, whoever was involved. You can even sue if there was a particular nurse that was treating the patient also. The thing is okay. that we don't know how much you're going to get from the nurse and the doctor maybe, uh, and but or from the state or the hospital. But remember when they joint and severally liable, whoever has the deeper pocket has to pay basically at the end of so the day. So I'm say okay. The, 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 the okay. You can go on, sir. Despite so the, it's not the only that it's, so it's not only that you can sue them based on vicarious liability. You can also sue on their personal capacity. Um, normally personal capacity under instances of gross negligence. Um, there was a there was a case where I think it could have been a year or two back. I'm not mistaken. Huh? Where they have actually started finding doctors criminally liable, even. So before they could only be held liable in delict because it wasn't really a criminal offense. But in one case, they actually held the doctor also criminally liable. So they had concurrent claims there. And the medical profession was in an uproar about that because that's something that's never been done before. But yeah, sue everybody, basically. That, that's what a good in, legal practitioner must do. In case of power cards, uh, we know for the fact that this is, um, it has been declared a state of disaster. Doesn't that act uh, in the reasonable? Maybe, yeah. You know what? I'm just thinking. There was a case overseas. I think it was um, where they had to cordon off areas of the street, and people couldn't get to work and couldn't get to areas. So they were infringing on the freedom of movement between certain blocks and they said it was a state of disaster and a state of emergency and they said basically it was reasonable. So infringing those rights basically was reasonable. Yeah, so it can be found that they said it because it's a state of disaster or whatever. It comes down to reasonable, but we've yet to see one being tested actually. I think so, um, also with the limitation of resources. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they, there's a case law where one was requiring a dialysis, and then they found that uh, there is a criteria who must qualify for it. In his case, he was on a situation where it is irreversible, so there was no way that dialysis was going to help. So to to help him, so it did not succeed his claim. Okay. Okay. No. Thank you for that, sir. Thank you. So because we are running out of time now, colleagues, I'm going to stop you there. I'm just going to quickly deal with some practice questions, right? Let's run through them very quickly, and I'm going to even show you the answers. So here's a question. It's Mr. Botha was walking his dog, Max, along a footpath in Santon one summer evening and decided to take a different route home from his usual one. So as Mr. Botha was crossing the road, Max, the dog, became very excited and started to run, forcing Mr. Botha to run. Max came across a pothole, but maneuvered his ray around. Unfortunately, Mr. Botha didn't, and he, due to the poor lighting, was not able to avoid the pothole. So he lost his balance, he fell, 
He injured his hip. And now bearing all of that in mind, answer the following questions. So 2.1, who should Mr. Botha sue for the injuries? The municipality. municipality. Okay. And then are there any pre prescribed formalities that must be complied with? Um, medical report. Um, uh, okay, okay, but here we're looking at specific prescribed formalities. Remember what I said when we're dealing with an organ of state? Yes, you have to notify uh, in terms of, uh, I think, the, uh, uh, suing the organ of state for money. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's an act. I forget what the act's name is. I think it's in terms of section three, one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so so uh, can you see the screen for me here? Um, so it's yes, Sanrel yeah. and you sue the city of Johann the Johannesburg Metropolitan Municipality. Um, just looking at, um, yes, the notice of delictual care must be given to Sanrel and the city of um, Johannesburg. And you were right in terms of section three, subsection 1a of this is the words i was looking for the institution of legal proceedings against certain organs of state act 2002 and that must be done within six months from the date of cause of action and now i've already given you the answer to the next questions <laughs> ma'am are you going to share with us that one um the answer you mean <laughs> yes i can <laughs> OK, what I can do, I'll just put it on a separate Word document, right? Yes. And then I'll yes. send it to Zukiswa and ask her to share it with you. That would be lovely. Thank just to see you. How OK, no problem. Then a the next question. Mr. Naidu was celebrating his 10th anniversary at his favorite restaurant one evening when all of a sudden members of the SAPS stormed in and attempted to arrest <coughs> him for theft, right? Mem yeah. Your, your slide is still on, Mr. It's oh, on okay. no, it's presentation. Think, so yeah. why I'm doing that is I can yeah. switch the, quickly switch to the answer. So here, uh, Mr. Naidu was ar arrested by the SAPS for theft. So he immediately pleaded that, hang on, guys, you are mistaken. I didn't commit any crime. The policeman ignored his pleas and asked him to accompany them to the police station. Mr. Naidu felt that he would not allow this and assaulted warrant officer Nkosi. So besides just refusing, he also assaulted the officer. Mr. Naidu felt that he would not, um, hang on, I'm repeating that now. Mr. Na the policeman managed to restrain Mr. Naidu, but in the process, they struck him and injured him in his right eye. Mr. Naidu was then taken to the police station and it transpired that he was actually telling the truth. So it was a case of, unlawful arrest, right? Um, he didn't actually commit the crime. Now the SAPS have made a mistake, bearing the aforesaid in mind and assuming additional facts when necessary, answer the following questions. Mr. Naidu was charged with assault because he assaulted the warrant officer Nkosi and Mr. Naidu pleaded that he acted in self-defense under the circumstances. Will the defense succeed? Yes. You, can, you can all answer at the same time. Yes. <laughs> no. Will succeed? No. Yes. succeed? No. 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 No that his conduct was necessary in order to protect his right to liberty and that his defensive action or defensive conduct was reasonable and not out of proportion. It seems doubtful that the defense will succeed as his conduct yes. was not necessary or reasonable. Right? Um, and I think but I didn't... Prof, the, but the arrest was unlawful. They did not yeah. even read him his rights. Yeah, yeah. So that was an attack on you already. Yeah, so it's a case of unlawful arrest there, definitely. Let me just but see even the that next question. A... Sorry. Yeah. Let, let, let I was me, going to ask let, let me just... that 
didn't he assault an officer of the law, which is in a, a crime in itself also? Um, yeah, in the sense that was it out of proportion? So we come back to that whole pro proportionality question all over again. OK, noted. Yeah. Um, OK, now I'm just want to quickly check. So Mr. Naidu wants to sue the SAPS for being humiliated in public in front of his friends and family, as well as for the injury sustained. Who should be cited as the defendants here? The Minister of Police Commissioner. The Minister of Police. The, uh, yeah, so the provincial the police commissioner. Yeah. Okay. So that that you are correct there. Now, before I give you that answer, let's look at the actual question for number four. Um, this one is um, to do with Tandi, and she had heard about the traveling circus that was coming to town. They advertised a number of new thrilling acts to be performed by the Bengal Tiger Simba. There was a number of disclaimers and notices displayed everywhere on the premises, including at the entrance. The notices at the circus um, stated that the circus would not be held liable for any injury or loss sustained by any person who entered the premises or used the amenities at the circus. So Tani bought a ticket and she, she bought it for the front row as she was excited to see the new act. And during one of the acts, the ringmaster lost control of the hoop that was laden with fire and it veered towards her where she was seated. Tandi sub subsequently sub sustained severe burns and wants to sue the circus for the injuries she sustained. Now, the question advise Tandi as to whether the circus can rely on that disclaimer and notice to escape liability. Answers? I don't think so. I don't think we can rely no. on it. No. They are. Yes, they I are. think she can. Especially now, right? Especially yeah, recently. She knew the risk, the risk of being close to the circus. Close, clear. But they cannot yes. rely on the notices that they've placed there. No. But can you can you the avoid any injury of sitting in the in the in the first negligence? And they okay, so so. So to give you the answer to that question, right? In, in the actual, I think in a previous assignment, those days when they had an assignment for PIC, right? Um, it was for 10 marks and in your notes, right? They refer to it as a ticket case and it's based on contractual construction of the quasi mutual assent. And there they say, um, on the one hand, it can be argued that liability on the part of the circus should be excluded. That's if you are relying on the decision of Durban Water Wonderland and others. Um, however, um, in Durban Water Wonderland, the question of negligence was not actually decided. And um, then if we look at more recent cases, right? Remember where we said the concept, um, besides it being ambiguous and clear, it must now be reasonable and fair. So recently, like the case of Naidu versus Birchwood, there the court upheld, remember, that it was unfair and unjust, those clauses. So if we look at recent cases, then yes, they might not be able to rely on that. So Tandi as an inv individual, and the circus as a corporate entry, they are not on the equal bargaining foot. If you remember from contractual law, um, parties when they are not on con equal bargaining um, statuses, the one party is more prejudiced than the other. So Tandy was seriously injured. Um, furthermore, the Consumer Protection Act will have an effect. And then um, generally marks were just awarded for students giving a logical reasoning. Um, also, if you relied on cases like Duffield versus Lillifontaine, Barkhazen versus Napier. What is the other one? Botha versus Rich. Yeah. So I will send you these answers as well. For your benefit, just to at least see that you understood and, and what kind of um, questions they are trying to get at. I don't know if it's going to be in any exams, colleagues, I promise. I haven't seen any exams, so I don't know, but I'm just giving you some examples. And then our last one, Mr. Radebe was uh, exhausted from his long day at work. 
While he was on his way home from work, he fell off to sleep on a train and he missed the station. By the time he realized that he missed his stop, the train had started moving. Mr. Adebe then jumped from the moving train while the door was open. Unfortunately, he fell and sustained injuries, bearing the aforesaid in mind. Answer the following questions. Who should Mr. Adebe sue for the injuries? Number one. And secondly, assuming that a summons was issued and served, the defendant, which is now Prasa, raises Volenti non fit in vira and stated that the, there was a notice on the door of the train warming, warning the commuters to stay clear of the doors whilst the train was in motion. So second part of the question, will the defence succeed? Any answer? Yes. No. 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 Yeah. Yes. Because so you're not entirely because there's contribute negligence they can be contributed con they can be contributory negligence so first of all you're going to sue prasa it's unlikely that dis the disclaimer defense will succeed yeah. right and there you can look at specifically seti don't rely on this paragraph numbers they are wrong from a previous uh, version of the guide some years back um, it is possible that the defense of Valenti non fit in vira might succeed and there's a case of shongwe um, in determining consent, remember the requirements that have to be proved. Um, and basically, yeah, they're expecting you to state the requirements there. Yeah. So that was just basically some questions. But um, overall, colleagues, did you get the gist of everything? Yes, yes. yes. Prof, you're so excellent. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Nice. Thank comment. you very much. I, I have to admit that you are definitely a very interactive class. I really enjoyed it. I know that there was some mayhem with how we answered, but you know what? It made it fun. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I will remember to send you those answers, right? But remember to ignore the paragraph numbers. They're not going to be correct. Um, I have left there my email address, right? If you have any burning questions, if something is not clear, um, you were too shy to speak up even, and you want to ask, um, you can always just email me. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you, Prof. 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 Thank you, Pr